Oh, righty. We are oh, alive. I have the thing on mute. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with episode 35. 35. Oh, man. Uh, of the Pathfinders podcast. I am Tree0311 here with my good friend and partner in crime. Hello, everyone. I am Nazareth. Eventually, I'm going to point to the right side of the screen. I always forget that. <laughs> I always want to. I have to remind myself that I need to point to the screen that you're on, and that will work. That's the way I have it set up. But I always feel like Why I have to point the opposite. That? I always feel like I have to go the other way. Anyway, uh, uh, Nazareth and I, we are the Pathfinders, and we are charting the way through all the nebulous information surrounding Star Citizen and its development. Um, and this evening, uh, we are going oh, uh, going through uh, every month. We do the we we read through the combined monthly reports. We take both of them and Nazareth um, diligently because um, a lot of the information is shared. So he makes a, a combined source document where the you know for the individual teams, if there is stuff from Squadron Forty Two and stuff from the PU, uh, he breaks it down that way. Uh, and so we make it essentially one document, and we read through the whole thing at once. With you know, um, say, um, AI or or UI, and this is the work they did on the PU. This is the work that they did for Squadron Forty Two, um, and that way it's just one video, one big long read through. But we do that, and then um, you know we we provide a little bit of commentary, a little bit of context as we're going through. But that way you get the raw, unfiltered version of the monthly report. No, um, no edits. Um, as well as um, our uh, objective, um, I hate to say feelings, but uh, how, uh, how we interpret some of it. Because um, especially the things that Nazareth covers, um, a lot of that can get um, a little bit technical, as well as uh, there's a lot of stuff that gets referenced that, you know, um, you know, if you don't follow the project super in depth, you might not have the the context for it. So we try and provide that as well as we go through it. Um but yeah, that's what we're doing this evening, and um, then next week uh, uh, we should be back on Monday. Hopefully Monday, maybe maybe I have to push it back to Tuesday just because I get in, I, I go out of town tomorrow for work, and I don't get in until late Sunday night. So um, yeah, we should be back with another episode next week, and we're, we're looking forward to uh, seeing what... Um, this quarter of content brings for, for star citizens since we've got ISC coming back this week, along with SCL. Um, and let's see, we've got people hanging out in chat. So that's always good. And I, I have, one. um, the, the PU monthly report up on, um, actually, and what I'm going to do real quick uh, I will pull up both monthly reports. Oh, did I just do that? And that way... Because it should have come out in my email. Where is it? And that way, if there's something in particular we want to show you guys, ah, we will have both up, and we can pull it up on screen. So that way, if you're watching, you can see what it is that we are talking about. And all right, cool. We have got that up, and I'll minimize that. All right, so we've got uh, Aether Drift hanging out in chat. Three uh, Aether Drift three sixty nine. Good to see you. Axis zero zero nine six. Good to see you, friendo. Champasta. Hello, hello. And uh, Sembod, uh, or is it Sembod O? I think I'm saying it right. O seven. Thanks for joining us. First time chat. Welcome aboard. Um, Oh, before we get started, uh, let's uh, we'll do our little channel update. Um, if this is your first time hanging out, we've already got uh, somebody apparently new. Um, everything I do on my Twitch and as well as my videos on YouTube, which is where the podcasts get uploaded to, I've just started doing short form content as well. Um, and I also do uh, Lore Equals gameplay streams. Those all get uploaded onto my YouTube. But everything I do is for charity. So if you are looking at chat, you can see at the top of the chat bar thing, it says stackup.org, $275 raised of our $1,000 goal. So any and all monetization I get from Twitch and YouTube goes to stackup.org. Um, I am a former infantry Marine, current Army, National Guard, flight paramedic. And so, ah, somebody, 
just filled with an E. Good to see you, bud. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to give back to charity. Um, gaming and gaming communities have been a big part of uh, my mental health and, and you know taking care of that. Um, and that's what stackup.org does. They connect veterans and active duty service members with gaming, uh, with video games and gaming communities um, to help them manage their, their PTSD um, and help them uh, cope with the, the stress of deployments and being gone for long periods. So that, that's what uh, my channels are all about, um, regardless of what the content is. And uh, Nazareth um, ha has been uh, working on some changes to his own content. Naz, uh, Naz if you want to uh, explain what you've got going on, um, so that way everybody's yeah. familiar. If you so, weren't already watching Nazareth's stream. <laughs> yes, for those of you who came over from my stream, thank you for stopping by. Um, so I was recently informed, and I already had a feeling of this, that trying to resurrect a seven-year-old channel or trying to even continue after having a channel for seven years and not really growing to the point you want to um it's it's almost impossible youtube has already labeled you a not good content creator and has put you in your box in the corner so i was recommended by some nice friends and other content creators to start anew so i now have a new channel called the nova forge that we are doing uh tutorials we are doing news and we're actually gonna be doing a lot more news this week and i'm gonna try and keep up on the news um going forward as much as i can and we also do uh, streams. So every day at 8 o'clock um, p.m. EST, we are live, including on podcast days. We do the uh, one to two hour pre-show where we talk about just kind of stuff that's been going on that we're not going to be able to cover in a uh, Pathfinders episode. Uh, we also have the main series I do on stream is actually trying to design a Argo ship in a, a terrible CAD program. Eventually, we'll be moving over to Blender. So that is one of those. Um, and tomorrow, we'll actually be doing some Siege of Orison gameplay because I have a new devs card, and I want to see how it works with actually trying to play Star Citizen and stream at the same time, something I was not able to do on my previous graphics card. Nice. Um, other than that, uh, we have the Discord. We have that kind of stuff, and we do a gameplay or game day with the Discord uh, once a month, so on the third Friday of every month. We do a game day. Very cool. And uh, yeah, it, the uh, the progress on your it, it's not a the, the name and type of your ship isn't a secret, right? The the progress on the Argo bulk is bulk, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah you can, it is you coming along quite well. And uh, being a massive Argo fanboy, I, I am a I am a big fan, and it's kind of inspired I, I by that um, uh, that one. It, it's a like a Lego model that you found and then you reskinned. Um, that mm -hmm. uh, so many people are, are fans of. Yeah. Um, I haven't done any exterior work yet, but I can't wait till the next episode because I actually stumbled upon, well, not stumbled upon, that's that's giving myself a little, little too little credit, but I uh, replicated some of the elements from the raft and I just was inspired to keep going. So I now have the corridor design, the base corridor design. So in the next time we do it, I believe that's going to be Saturday, if not randomly sooner um we're gonna be starting to flesh out the corridors of the of the habitation area very cool i look forward to seeing I'm it i'm so excited you should uh make uh, try and uh, get some like screenshots of different things and post them in your discord um and feel free to post them in mine yeah. as well because that's us yeah um if you like argo you should check it out and if you don't like argo what the hell's wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> but uh let's uh, I mean, like banu is the opposite so anyone who likes banu probably doesn't like argo uh yeah that's probably right yep yeah mm, tisk tisk well let's uh <laughs> let's get into the monthly reports um i'm going to transition us into our viewing screen and that way we can you can see the monthly reports as we're going down them um and um uh, yeah and so give us one second transitioning in three two one and thank there you drift. or another drift whatever it is a aether computer? drift aether drift are we aether saying drift. It right? ether drift is it aether or ether <laughs> aegis or aegis aegis or egis yeah <laughs> but you know it's egis <laughs> ether got it ether drift 369 there we go cool Either All right. Uh, 
And I need to pull up. Why do I have two? Huh. Weird. Okay. I had two things of OneNote open. And I don't know oh, why. Oh, fun. Yeah, weird. Super fun. So the fun part about me not hosting is I get to be anywhere but the page. Yeah. Let's see if I can make that. Can I make that small? There we go. And you're like halfway could... down on the on the page. Is that where you got to in your personal read through? Uh, this is my third read through. Of the the PU, um, I didn't do a third of the Squadron Forty Two one, so I was rereading it today while I was doing Daddy Daycare. I had my kid and um, my uh, my good friend's kid over while they were at work. So, ooh, I got a nice. real Star Warsy vibe with that transition. Gave me goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I inspired it. <laughs> yes, and let's see. Because that that's exactly back. what I wanted to go for. Like, I don't. I'm definitely more tr- Star Trek than Star Wars, but that transition is just famous, and it's mm-hmm. it's so good. There we go. That's that's better. All right. Okay. So, um, Nazareth, why don't you start us off uh, with the the intro as you always do? All right. Now I've gone five uh, windows out of the way. So, for the Star Citizen PU Month Report, it's November, December 2022. This is Welcome to November and December's PU Monthly Report, which combines everything worked on during the last two months of 2022. Read on for everything done around to round out the last year, including new tech for Alpha 318, updates to narrative content, and the development of an all-new vehicle, or all-new vehicles. On the Squadron 42 side, uh, welcome to the November and December Squadron 42 uh, development report. And close, you'll find the details on the latest progress made across the campaign, including crowd control, fire propagation, and alien character development. Thank you for your continued support for Squadron 42. Sincerely, CAG Communications. All right. So starting off um, is AI content. And let's see. Uh, Do we have AI? Nope, not on this one. So bingo, this side. Uh, AI content for Squadron 42. Um, So toward the end of the year, uh, the AI content team completed a significant number of tasks for Chapter 15. Uh, This included prototyping animations for crowds, mm, for crowds and combatants, alongside several usables and animation sets for dejected characters around the level. Dejected. (laughs) Sad characters. Mm. I wonder, so when they, they talk about crowds, they talk about dejected characters. They've also talked about in the, you know, in the squadron 42 monthly report previously, they talked about how did they, was it that they call them? Um, I don't think they use the word hobo, but it was homeless, you know, homeless or, or, or something like that. Um, homeless it's people. It. And I think, I think it's all, this is all part of the same chapter, but yeah, they have mentioned, um, uh, uh, uh like an, a homeless NPC and you know, that mm. as, as a, Career par- you know, paramedic. That's <laughs> just sort of, I was like, what? Oh gosh, homeless people. Oh boy. Um, the welding engineer, ooh, cool, has also re- uh, received a lot of improvements. Uh, the team made an extensive pass on the, animation, on the animations and progressed with the technical challenges of getting the welding helmet, multi tool parts, and welding effects working together. Uh, considerable work has also, was also done to get a basic version of an AI character. Interacting with a variety of usables found in living spaces. The bridge crew behavior and animations also received further iteration and are now starting to look polished. Animation supported AI features with box carrying, which resulted in a number of significant visual improvements. A large amount right. of production and organization was, uh, work was done too, resulting in a comprehensive animation schedule that details all the known work required for squadron 42 to be content complete now they're talking about content complete from ai content but you know the animation yeah um or sorry yeah from uh uh comprehensive animation schedule that details all the known work required it's the animation needed for the ai content team um for Mm. their work to be complete so um that's a 
you know, that's a pretty significant thing that they are, okay, what do we have left on this list? You know, to, in order to have, you know, you do that whole deal and say, you know, we, we are, uh, our part is done. You know, the rest of you guys need to get your proverbial (laughs) together. Um, I mean, they have their, they have their work now and they're not like, yeah, I doubt they'll be done like soon, Mm -hmm. but they have the schedule to get done. Yeah. They have a schedule, you know, and they're prioritizing what's left. Um, but it's nice that they're making a lot of uh, uh, progress on all the AI content and getting the NPCs of the campaign um, working, you know, well and um, feeling very alive and polished. Um, yeah, there's verbiage in here when they talk about things looking polished and, and you know, the, the way they write things. It's uh, These are good indicators uh, for the AI content side of the level that uh, the AI, the NPCs function at um, and where they are as far as progress um, in regards to the campaign. So good to read, good to hear. Uh, and I will toss it over to you, Nazareth, for AI features. And let's see, the Wait. first part is Squadron 40, or no, um, for Starts PU. Us. Yeah, which yeah. is real short. <laughs> yep, single sentence. AI features added the end of the year supporting investigation and bug fixing for 318. That's all I said. Because most of the team is over on Squadron 42. So, Squadron 42 AI features. Last year, the team implemented AI functionality into manned turrets. Like other objects that NPCs need to be able to use, the turrets have been set up as usables, which describes the logic and animation required to use them. As with the players, animation it, our animations are synchronized with the turrets, turret movement so that AI grips the turret handles or turrets by its handles while rotating on the spot to aim horizontally, oh, tilts uh, and tilts the turret up and down to aim vertically. Ta-da. Yay, AI can use turrets now properly. Instead of just non corporeal turrets moving around or non corporeal AI inside of turrets that's just aiming around. That's mm-hmm. how you get, you know, a... Uh, yeah, you'll it? actually see them doing the movements just like you would actually see them, you know, doing the flight movements. They're going to do the same thing for turrets. Yeah. One yeah, step so... closer to actually having to fight AI on an Idris. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and, you know, for, the, also... for the big turrets, um, especially, you know, um, like on things like the Javelin and such, you know, if you can, you know, if mm-hmm. you're running down the hall or the corridor or something, and you see the AI operating turrets, so it'll be really immersion-breaking if they're just sitting there and the thing's moving around and they're not <laughs> moving their hands or doing anything. You know. Yep. It is not, they're not just computers slotted into a thing. They, they actually do need to move. Mm-hmm. Uh, the team also worked on implementing a wide range of panic, cower, and surrender behaviors for both unarmed civilians and enemy NPCs that run out of ammunition and weapons. I, I need to implement these. it. I can't for wait my to see characters. these. <laughs> <laughs> What's my keybind for panic? <laughs> <laughs> Gib. They they should definitely have some panic emotes. Mm-hmm. Um, if an unarmed civilian sees that, that an enemy has unholstered a weapon, aka if you pull out a weapon inside of a populated zone, they will notify characters nearby using a wild line and pan- and then panic run to a hidden point uh, of cover. They will continue to run away from both the enemy or from the enemy, if their cover is compromised. Unarmed characters will that hear this information will turn to react to the enemy and then panic themselves. By randomizing <laughs> the speed at which the NPC reacts, the devs can generate n- a natural-looking range of behaviors from a crowd responding to a threat. Yay! Realistic cowering. <laughs> I I cannot wait. Like This is one of like the big things I'm waiting for to kind of like bring... Uh, landing zones kind of alive is that like that crowd mentality especially like something during like ie or something or if they get some way of helping like atmo have a npc crowd there and then like a uh, someone crashes and then they have to cower away from the crash that kind of thing that would be amazing Ooh, yeah. that is all tinfoil hat stuff but like in a landing zone uh there is not going to be an armed zone it's not going to automatically shut off weapons Mm-hmm. It can. They have lore to back that up, and it's just, they've previously said that's not how they want to handle it. They want to handle it that you can have weapons 
if you're at a certain like if you're a bounty hunter, you can have a simple weapon. Fine. But if you unholster it in a populated zone, let's say Hardcore Plaza, it's a no go. You will be taken down by security. So the civilians around need to react accordingly. And obviously this is that kind of thing. Um, but this is all so far being developed specifically with squadron in mind. Moving on. Armed enemies that have run out of ammo in, and weapons. Will, before you continue, what? in theory, yep. with quantum, yes. you should have yes. AIs committing criminality, you know, criminal behaviors in landing zones too, you know, on foot, you know, yeah. in stations and such. It won't just be players, you know. I mean, you could be as a player the victim of criminal behavior, you know, uh, FPS criminal true. behavior, um, you know, or or you could just witness it, you know, uh, stop thief. Yeah, I'm not going to chase him, you know, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, and just a little caveat on top of that. Quantum is the non-corporeal state. Um, VMPC, or um, what's it called? Mm -hmm. Subsumption yeah. is the visual state. Yep. So it'll be, it'd be uh, a subsumption MPC, not a quantum MPC. Yeah. Just to make sure terminology like stays above board here. Quantum, you don't see, you never see a quantum. You never see a quantum. Uh, let's see. Armed enemies that have run out of ammo and weapons will run to cover while searching for valid ammo and weapons to pick up. Again, if their cover is exposed, they will reevaluate and run to a new position. If the player aims at an unarmed or or armed or unarmed NPC, they will stay on the spot but turn to face the player and move through sequences of surrender animations whilst communicating with the player. That is going like that is a lot of work for like that 10 seconds of gameplay. Oof. Uh, let's see. As part of combat, the team worked on the medic AI behavior to allow NPCs yes. to find incapacitated, <laughs> incapacitated peers that need reviving and use med pens to get them back into the fight. Can we have the? Can we have follow NPCs yet in Star Citizen? Please, I want to. Mm -hmm. I want to hire a medical guide to run into bunkers with me and just res me when I get down. <laughs> Soon, TM. That's what I want. That's in this right. report. <laughs> Yeah, it's been um, multiple it, times for Squadron, which means once it's done, it will be validated, and then you know, mm -hmm. at the end of whatever year they're working on it, then we'll come into the game. So maybe end of twenty four. Um, let's see. This involved bringing together numerous existing functionalities from Viz areas, including the usable system, use channel to revive, consumable items, the med pen, synchronized animations between two NPCs, and I imagine they have another step to go for the NPC plus the player, ragdoll into animations to allow characters to stand up from ragdoll, the subsumption to script the behavior. Uh, the next stage is to integrate this behavior with the standard react to presumed dead bodies behavior to generate more complex behaviors. That was a very long everything it has to do with everything else, but that just that little amount of work to get a NPC to find and res another NPC, that entire paragraph just lined out everything that it had to touch. Welcome to Star Citizen. Holy crap. Yeah. When you're when you're collecting or collecting, when you're connecting multiple <laughs> holistic systems that are designed in order to you know, each one is holistic and systemic. But then you have to connect them in a sequence in order to get something done um, in, in a way that you don't have to script it. You know, and said it, it works as a mm -hmm. system. You know, a combined you know a, a group of systems. You know, it, it's a lot of initial work. It's a lot of you know when you the the laying the groundwork is, is harder. But once it's done, then it's done. You know, it, it's not having to re redo this whole thing over and over again for each instance that this occurs. It just happens. Um, and yeah. that's why they're doing Normally, it. So that way it works in the squadron 42, but also when they port it over to the PU, it should function as intended, you know, obviously yeah. server FPS permitted. <laughs> right. Normally what games do for this kind of thing is they'll have a canned animation. The NPCs will just be like set to, look around them or follow orders from the player. Um, like if they're so, and then once they get to that point, they'll just animate and their inventory will go down by one. That is like the simple way of doing it. They'll, they'll have a radius of uh, attention or whatever it is. Um, and when a player that is down is inside that radius, they'll go, Oh, I should res him. They go over, play an animation and their medical supplies is down by one. This is a systemic system to not only 
let him use already made up stuff, but also to evaluate the entire scenario. And that I think is really cool. Is it necessary? No, none of this stuff is necessary. That's the best <laughs> part. Star Citizen is going for a fidelity level that no other game dares because they have the time and they have the money to do so. It's necessary to duplicate it across a single player campaign and a you know a, a multiplayer online game. Otherwise there would be a lot of duplication of effort. Um you know if it, you could do it the traditional way but there would be a lot of duplication of effort um uh, uh you know, on either one or the other. And so that's why they're doing this in order to reduce you know it's a there's more investment on the front end but it saves when it comes to time investment on the back end like especially if they're going to be making uh multiple episodes of the campaign you know and they're doing this in a way so that way it um yeah, doing it for this process makes it very uh, far far easier for them to replicate that sort of um you know, multi-tiered behavior uh, uh, and and instance, you know, occurring in the game with other things. You know, it doesn't have to be revive. It could be something else. It could be, you know, something somebody coming along and giving you a magazine when you're out of uh, ammunition, um, or or giving you something else. It doesn't have to be something medical. Um, so yeah, using a uh, mining gadget. Bingo. Yep. Yeah. Because that will um, that will use all of those things. Find it. The, the use an item. Uh, if you have a NPC coming along to help you do something uh, like mantling, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It, Let's see. Uh, AI feature also started work on a new non-human character. New. Let's read that again. Hmm? New non-human. Yep. Started work on a new non-human character. This could mean one of two things. Starting to work out an alien or a specific character that is an alien. So. The language is interesting. Uh, you, you, mm -hmm. This is about that. creating a new set of animations for the new character and sliding them into an existing basic framework from there. They were able to rapidly develop the core functionality, which was passed to the design team for feedback. So either this is a hero and a hero van duel. Well, they say AI about... features also started work on a new non-human character. This involved creating a new core set of animations for the new creature. So, oh, OK, I completely. But why, why would they call a creature a character? The only thing I can think of is like. Uh, you know, if, it, if it's a character, it isn't. Um, That's true. It doesn't it necessarily more... have lines. It doesn't have lines, but, you know, it might be uh, bespoken, unique to the setting of the campaign. Think um, mm -hmm. uh, Luke Skywalker on Hoth and the giant. Mm -hmm. um, what's the Yeti thing called? A Yeti. It has a different name in Star Wars. I'm sure, but it's a Yeti. I, a I know by no other name. Or was that the. Yeah, Wampa. Yep. Oh, okay. um, it could be. It could be a, a creature like that, you know, in a, a, a that sort of type of scene in the campaign. Because yeah. um, I feel like, like it, they, they wouldn't call it a creature if they were saying Xi'an or yeah, uh, uh, Banu. Uh, but the fact that they say a new non-human character for the new creature, um, it's it makes me think that it's something that it, it, it's unannounced. You know, they yeah. haven't talked to us about that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, they also last year worked a lot on the creature pipeline. Yes. Mm -hmm. So very much so. It's probably something that's not bipedal. Cool. Ooh. Non bipedal uh, creature is coming to a universe near you yeah. soon. TM with point towards teeth. the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, but point <laughs> teeth, probably <laughs> towards the end of the year. A few areas of work were revised to tidy up loose ends. The first of these was Vanduul investigation behaviors. During the cat and mouse gameplay section, the Vanduul will now investigate the full events in the room with different animations for different alertness levels. Sweet. Nice oh. polish. Uh, after so feedback Bruce Willis from the design is totally team, screwed. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> well, just like we saw at CitizenCon, they won't like 
go into the vents. They're like, oh, that vent cover is fine. Unless they're really alert. So if you put the vent cover back, you're good. If the vent cover stays ajar, you're Mm -hmm. good. Because then they'll investigate it. it. If you sound like a wampa going through the vents, they're going to be highly alert. and They're going to look into the dang thing versus just sort of peer up there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Remember, they can hear you <laughs> in space. They can hear you. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Uh, after some feedback from design, the new functionalities were added for the accuracy calculation. This included adding the mercy timer, firing time, and the time sense scene accuracy modifiers. The Mercy Timer gives players a firing chance to escape the from heavy fire by making the AI inaccurate for a set period for a set period when the player's health has reached a certain threshold. Many games do this. I hope no one like gets like offended about this. Games will cheat for you. That's part of game design. Um, Uncharted made sure that the first or first couple shots when the second you see an NPC has a 0% chance of hitting you. That way you are not shot by something you don't understand. And this is a big part of game design, is the player should always understand where the threat is. So currently in game, if you play on 318, there's a, and the server's running properly, there's a high chance you will get sniped from around a corner because the AI is that good. So these kind of things, yeah. These kind of things will help the NPCs not be so good that they're killing the player without the player being having any time to react. And that's what this kind of system does. It's not necessarily to because players are bad or NPCs are too good. It's to make the entire experience because it's a video game, not life or death. It's supposed to be enjoyable. And it makes it believable, too, because if you sort of accidentally pop in on each other, you know, uh, in mm-hmm. in general, for many scenarios, if you you both walk around a corner, you know he's not going to have time to sight in on you and, and you know uh, get you know really good you know accuracy mm. just like you wouldn't you know unless you right. unless but they're even, absolutely even waiting so. and staring right down their sights and they know you're coming. So you know it yeah. makes it fairly but to me it makes it more believable as well. Yeah, e- even if like the NPC like heard you walking down the hall. There's a chance, and, and this does technically have a thre- uh, player health threshold. Um, so if you're like 10% health walking down a corridor, they'll still have at least some time where they're not going to be as good at shooting. So, um, And realistic realism also counts in this next one. Uh, the firing time accuracy modifier reduces the accuracy over fighting periods for similar purposes. The time sent... Oh, so basically, firing SMG constantly you'll get the NPCs will get worse as they fight, which is normal. Your, your muscles get tired. So your yep. aim starts. Uh, the aiming cone starts getting bigger. Uh, the time since seen accuracy modifier allows the NPC or allows the player a grace period after moving out of cover during which the attacker's accuracy will be lower, much like the uh, uh, what is it called uh, uncharted thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The accuracy distance calculator was also changed to be curve based for greater control. That is AI feature in both SC and Squadron 42. Uh, So that would be you for AI tech. Alrighty. AI tech. And AI tech is all. Or no, it's. Yeah, all SC. Yep, all SC. And it's just duplicated on the PU. Uh, before I start with AI tech, um, I, I forgot to do something. Usually when I'm doing any sort of space-based stream, whether it's Pathfinders, Armchair Admirals in Generals, I'm playing Star Citizen or some, uh, another space game, I try to keep on hand some space-related beer uh, to drink while we're hanging out. And so tonight I'm drinking this um i have gotten beer from this uh, brewery multiple times because almost all their beers are space-based but this is from ecliptic brewing it's ice giant cold ipa it's a seasonal um it's very fitting considering i live in boise idaho and it's you know pretty dang cold and snowy here so that's what we are drinking tonight out of my favorite mug which has my old unit emblem on it right here pretty cool so yeah, when you when you see me sipping, that's what I'm sipping on. And the the name of the game is every time Nazareth and I say ne- uh, or I say nebulous, um, I have to drink. So I usually will have a, an empty mug well before we get to the end of the episode. 
<laughs> so stay thirsty, my friends. All right. AI tech for the PU. Um, so during the last months of 2022, the AI tech team progressed with features required for both the Persistent Universe and Squadron 42. The team continued to iterate on more complex navigation links uh, to extend the capabilities of NPCs and where they're able to move to, including implementing adapters for airlocks and elevators. This is fun. This is interesting. Dun, dun, um, so instead dun. of the AI just not only being able to navigate um, on the surface of a planet, um, if you can imagine, they will be able to walk around using the navigation mesh and then walk right up to a um, an outpost or... Um, you know, the airlock doors, uh, the, the doors at, um, let's say, Microtech, where that garage thing is, and transition and walk into that and then go through the airlock, uh, go through an elevator, and then get out, um, you know, in order to continue the, their path to wherever they're going. Basically, this opens up the rest of the game for NPCs to go through. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we know that connecting. they can fly. We know that they can walk on the ground. Now they can take elevators out of the hangar or down into a, a down or up from a uh, underground facility, and they can use airlocks on outposts and landing zones. And so ships. this kind of just opens up the entire game for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they've talked about uh, AI using uh, zero G traversal, so they should be able to operate mm -hmm. in zero G, come back through the airlock, and then transition into the ship and walk around again. Um, so it's a, a really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, they're really tying yeah, it all is, together. This is both terrifying because that means they can follow yeah. us through elevators. And <laughs> I'll airlocks. find you. <laughs> but also, when we get dynamic uh, population in, it means we can see them milling about not just inside the landing zone or not just inside a an outpost. They can be milling about like uh, at outpost where you're doing cargo or a mining outpost. They can actually be milling about outside and go through the airlock back inside when they need to. Yeah. And they so. can come and go, they can they can leave the immediate location. They can go into the spaceport and hop on a ship and mm -hmm. go to someplace else. Um that yep. is that is by design. Um so let's see, continuing on. Um so the team continue to iterate on more complex navigation links to extend the capabilities of NPCs where they're able to move to, including implementing adapters for airlocks and elevators. Now NPCs will know that in order to traverse an airlock, they will need to interact with multiple consoles to adjust the pressure and open the door. Oof. Well, hope we don't have to end up doing that. Uh, for elevators, navigation links were created to connect multiple floors. Cool. A navigation link was also created to request a reconnection with the navigation mesh triangles each time an elevator stops at a floor to allow NPCs to transition in and out. Based on navigation link connections, an NPC will now know how to request an elevator to go to a specific floor. New event notifications were also added, sent by the elevator when it arrives at a floor, so that the actor will know to get on or off. Um, and hopefully, uh, if NPCs are lucky, by the time they are able to do this, the, the elevators will work, and we won't just have a whole bunch of dead NPCs falling into the center of the planet or out into space. Yeah, evil I regen clone, good it. times. <laughs> hey, at least it'll be fair now. It won't just be us. Yeah, sucking. the NPCs too. I mean, hopefully, yeah. like when this gets like actually put into the game, we will have again dynamic populations, and we won't have that standard. Uh, What's it called? Uh, entourage of NPCs loaded in every time landing zone is loaded in. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, the base functionality for NPCs driving ground vehicles was completed. NPCs can now move to a vehicle and get into the driver's seat, find a path suitable <laughs> pardon me, for the size of the vehicle and drive along it. Uh, this work involved the creation of a new subsumption task, a new movement request type, and updating the movement planner to know how to process the request. The team also added new functionality to the navigation systems that marks entities to be ignored during navigation mesh generation. Um, the team also added new functionality to the navigation systems that marks entities to be ignored during the navigation mesh generation. Entities to be ignored. Um, I'm guessing, you know, things that they wouldn't be able to navigate on, you know, like big rocks and I don't know. 
Um, NPC perception was another major topic uh, worked on toward the end of the year. The team implemented a new adapter for air, uh, for action areas to specify lightness, darkness, which will influence NPCs' visual perception. Uh, so that's uh, going to be really interesting. You know, if you uh, have the, the cover of night, you know, they won't be able to see you um, unless you're uh, more closely or more close to them. Um and vice versa, a new extender to propagate engine sounds as stimuli was also created, which will make NPCs aware of vehicles in their proximity. This was the first step toward uh, behaviors that react to ground vehicles in spaceships. Um, so yeah, now when you come you know, screaming in and landing near an AI with your spaceship, they'll actually turn uh, before you start shooting at them. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Uh, while working on perception improvements, the devs fixed AI visual perception through glass. Now NPCs will be able to detect uh, targets behind glass and also understand that in order to shoot at them, they need to move to the other side. Um, I wonder if we're going to have breakable glass or if all glass in SC is uh, bulletproof. You know, um, I mean, that's kind of see. like one of the big features is the diamond glass, diamond laminate yeah. glass. Is it all that way, though? You know, or... or... Will AI I know, know which windows can be shot through? And That's broken? true, because in Starman, to... we do have breakable glass. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Huh. Yeah, for locomotion, improvements continued on the sharp turn assets and how they're triggered for alien characters or at walking speeds. Related to this, work began on following tech, as we were talking about earlier, which will be used in connection with the buddy AI behavior. For this, the team improved short stops, collision avoidance with players, and speed handling based on the leader's change in speed. So basically, they're making it so that way NPCs can follow you, but they won't like bump into you when you stop, and they'll actually be able to keep up with you if you're running. You know, they will adjust their speed uh, based off of you know um, them following you. And it's, so hopefully, we won't have the dreaded like super slow NPC missions. Yeah, you turn around and it's like, where the hell is he? And he's on the other side of the map because he's been walking while you've been sprinting. Mm -hmm. um, for the Apollo subsumption tool, CIG naming, new functionality was added to create and modify the subsumption master graph. A lot of feedback from the designers was implemented, including the addition of an interface to create roles and sub roles, find reference functionality, improved interaction with... Uh, functions and the multi-graph tab and improvements to grid snapping. I want to, you know, so uh, as we always say, Nazareth and I are, we are fools for tools. Um, and I would love to have ISC um, go over what the Apollo subsumption tool is because subsumption is their uh, AI system that you see when NPCs are physicalized and running around doing their thing. They are subsumption AI, subsumption NPCs. If there is a tool involved uh, with subsumption AI, subsumption NPCs, I want to know more about that tool. Um, and I've only seen it mentioned like a couple of times. And so... Um, if uh, I had to take probably... a guess what it was, it would be that subsumption is the... Uh, like the, the raw data that, you're, that drives them. And mm -hmm. Apollo is the tool that builds the subsumption. Yeah, it could be. Um, I, I want to I want to hear more about that. I'm hoping they'll cover that in ISC and tell us more about that tool because that would be something interesting to cover as part of like a scanner anomaly. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Considering we've done the the other big name tools, and if this year and a part of last year they're doing so much work on a, a, the levels of AI tech. Uh, that would be something interesting to, to cover and see more about, especially with how systemic it's supposed to be. Um, but that is it for AI tech. Yeah, because there isn't anything for Squadron 42. So it's back to you for animation. All right. Another short uh, one for the Persistent Universe side. So for Star Citizen animation team, the end of 2022 saw facial animation supporting various trailers and other needs. They also shot motion capture for some background character animations that will be used in the Persistent Universe. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Squadron 42 side, last month, uh, last months of 2022 saw gameplay animation working on Vanduul execution, zero G player movement, and various animation sets for background life. They also added a skill level variation to takedowns alongside new weapons. 
They shot, uh, they then they shot mocap for a variety of additional scenes and gameplay needs, and created facial animations for various story and background characters. I like how animations very succinct, succinct in their um, reports. Mm -hmm. like, there's a lot in there, very succinct. So it's back to you for art characters, both SC and Squadron. All right, let's start uh, with the SC side of things. So for character art uh, for the PU, at the end of 2022, 2022 um, character art finishes ta finished tasks for the Frontier workwear outfits and Frontier undersuits. They also fixed various bugs related to clipping. Uh, character concept art polished concept handoffs for the Frontier outfits and continued with concept exploration on Fauna ooh, and the Duster Faction. So they are working... Uh, they've been doing a lot of work on the a uh, on the behaviors and stuff for um uh, for fauna for animals um but they're also uh, doing concept exploration for more animals other than the handful that we already know about uh, so that's good to see and uh character art for squadron 42 the concept artists work on, uh, worked on tattoo and armor variation concepts for the Screaming Galsons to help fill out the faction and continued work on a key campaign character. Ooh. Uh, the artists also worked on the Screaming Galsons armors along with the Navy pilot flight suit and a new creature. Uh, I wonder if that's the same creature that uh, you were reading about earlier. Um, tech art skinned the main Navy jumpsuit and paired assets for the deck crew, engineers, and uh, and gunners and that is it for character art back to you for wait a minute don't worry i'm fixing it i'm fixing it okay <laughs> just skip it we'll get back to it later uh back to you for art ships and um why don't you do art ships and art environment and then we'll be back on track uh, I already put it environment art for uh, Squadron Forty Two, or I put it somewhere else in the in the dock. Um, okay, so art ships in the U.S. The ship team made the fishing touches on the Drake Corsair. Once complete, they moved onto the white box stage of two new vehicles. Ooh. What they say, what they are, no one says. For one, they brainstormed several options for entering and exiting. Good, because he messed up on a lot of other ships, aka the Carrick and MSR. Mm -hmm. uh, white box began on new on a new production vehicle too ah that's where that came from <laughs> we were talking about that earlier today production vehicle not producing a vehicle but a vehicle for production a new uh, production vehicle the what is it the Argo MCV is that what it was called that got mentioned uh, that was found referenced in some star citizen files yes mm -hmm. i bet you that's the production vehicle could be could be indeed uh, let's see the uk team completed their pass on the salvage feature ensuring all major visual and gameplay issues were resolved for the ex for ship exteriors and they're still working on the minor ones they were just uh the ptu updated today with a lot of um salvage bug fixes today um, then they began work on the Crusader Spirit, which is progressing through white box phase. Woot! I cannot wait. I, I know they said they're probably not going to work on the E1, but give me the E1. I cannot wait to get into the E1. I can't wait. Um, this is a quote from the ship team. It says, The biggest challenge has been ensuring the escape raft on the VIP variant is fully functional at this ver at this early stage so we can avoid extra work in the future ship team now the vip variant is the e1 so they're at least going through white box for the e1 um but they said they probably won't i think this was during the the super super ship talk whatever they wanted to call it during uh yeah november IE. During IE. yeah um so they said specifically that they, they probably won't put the e1 into the game and the other variants will get into the game because the e1 requires the entire game loop of uh passenger transport but once the E once the E one starts getting into the game, the Genesis is not far behind. <laughs> and also, Very we can likely. like fill the seats in our uh, our ships. That so giant cargo haulers like the whole C, possibly coming out later this year, can also take on some passengers because that's what 
cargo hauler to do in sci-fi. Uh, let's see. And then the yeah last sentence here says the bulk of white box work was also completed on an unannounced vehicle and develop development began on an all new small ship. So I assume by directive they're not saying ship or vehicle anymore because they said vehicle three different times here. Mm -hmm. But they but also said, they said small ship. An all new ship. I mean, so at least they specified it and narrows it two down. Two vehicles with multiple uh, eg enter and exits. Then we got the Crusader Spirit. And then we got another announced vehicle that's also white box mostly complete. Mm -hmm. So it's three vehicles and a small ship plus the uh, Crusader series. That's insane. Jeez. Let's see. One second. I'm looking at stuff on... The progress tracker. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shampoza said, why not put the E1 in so players can shell our old players around? Uh, because CIG. John Crew doesn't want to introduce more ships without their intended gameplay. Even if it has partial gameplay by moving players around. Uh, the, the big thing, you know, because um, if you think about it, let's see. Uh, we're gonna add these to a group. Like even if it added like only a week onto the overall dev time that they would have spent on the Crusader Spirit series, that's one week that they could have spent on the Endeavor or the the what's the what's the other one? The the repair one, the Crucible. Yeah. Or the Liberator or the uh... with the NPC population being at least nine to one for to players. If you are doing passenger transport, the majority of your passengers are going to be NPCs. Um, oh, yeah. If, if you think about it, Galaxy if you players. remember watching the quantum presentations and you see all those little quanta dots moving around on the system, not all those quanta dots, in fact, a lot of those quanta dots aren't just quanta piloting their own ships and going from place to place. A lot of those quanta dots are being transported to where they are going to work at their new job because the quanta will move around based off of their affinities and, and, and personality traits um, to different areas to do to do work. Um, yes. Because you Players need to have... Are... Yeah. As part of the recipe Play... system for production, you need to have quanta mm -hmm. at a production facility, whatever it's producing, in order to do the work. It's just like if you're doing a colony sim. Uh, that that's yeah. essentially what the quantum <laughs> simulation is. Um, yes, and players do inhabit a higher than normal bracket. Most NPCs do not have enough money to own their own ship, mm -hmm. so they yeah, will be using public transit to get around. We're we're upper middle so, class in Star Citizen, Hooray. yeah. <laughs> um, so the for uh, for art ships, so they. Um, they, the the ship team made the finishing touches to the Drake Corsair. Once complete, they moved on to the white box stages of two new ships. Um, so the, this is vehicle concept art. And then um, the, the, the thing is, and it's hard to know um, because they, we don't know if they moved on to the white box uh, stages of two new vehicles uh, vehicles that are going into production or if they are finishing up the concept phase because white box is now a part of the vehicle concept phase. Um, and then the bulk of white box work was also completed for an unannounced vehicle and development began on an all new small ship. So white box work, white box work, white box work, but they don't talk about any, anything specifically new concept. Um, so we don't know if these are the four vehicle, you know, the four vehicles that are in concept you know, uh, phase right now um, with the vehicle concept art team. And so ostensibly um, they are doing uh, white box phase work on these vehicles, but all four of these are not currently scheduled for production. You only see vehicle concept art, vehicle concept art, vehicle concept art, vehicle concept art. Um, but that doesn't mean this is all inclusive because there are the other um, teams. Not to mention, literally everything's going to change on the eighth. Yeah, I mean, well, things will change. But um, so there's vehicle content EU, 
which has um, one unannounced vehicle that is in design and art um, with vehicle oh. content and not, uh, let's see if we pull this one up. So this vehicle um, has not been in concept work um, or con uh, been in the concept phase since the advent of the progress tracker in January, 2021. So this is the vehicle content team right here, currently doing some work on an unannounced vehicle that was concepted prior to January, 2021. And then that's not the, going into squadron. Yep. Yeah. Not squadron, not squadron. And then there's another one that's coming up and this one Let's also look to see if there's vehicle concept artwork. Nope. Again, another vehicle that is being worked on uh, in the near future, you know, based off the current schedule, that was concepted prior to January 2021. So when people are like, why are they concepting new ships? Well, it's because the concept art team is always working on new concepts um, and getting them white box complete in order for them to have a back, you know, in order for them to always be something for them to do. But also, you know, yeah. they have ships that they've been concepting that are, you know, so they have things that they can, okay, we're going to get started working on this because it is related to what the, the gameplay and feature teams are working on, you know, what their priorities are over the next year or two. So that way we can have a ship release with a new gameplay feature. And so right. because of all these new things that are coming online and have the ability to function because of PES getting moved out of the way, we're seeing a lot of work on older concepts being done, things going into production that now make sense that otherwise wouldn't yep. have. Um, yeah, they always need probably a probably every um, manufacturer gets a small, medium, and large in backlog. Plus, they mm -hmm. need at least one ship of every gameplay loop that's intended to be in the game. That way, they can look at their back their their cat their catalog of concepts and say, "We can do this, this, and this this year." Pull those yep. off the shelf, put them in production. Yeah. Um, like they, they always have a backlog. And the stuff that gets sold is not sold because like the concepts that get released are not just, oh, this is the thing the concept guys came up with this year. It's we doing this to make money. Like the stuff that goes into concept sale and goes into like like the galaxy or the Polaris or like stuff like that is not is no longer just, hey, we got something here to here it is, guys. It's now much more a marketing thing because you one you can just get in the game a month a quarter after it comes out anyway, and two they are trying and they have been pretty well succeeding getting the bulk of stuff flight ready the second it's done. Mm -hmm. Like almost every patch now, there's a flight ready ship or a yep. straight to flyable ship. So it'll be interesting to see what the roadmap update on February eighth looks like and how that affects ve the vehicle content teams. Um, mm -hmm. But right now, their big focus, um, and probably for a while going forward, is Squadron 42 vehicle support for both EU vehicle content and, let's see, um, US vehicle content, as well as the resource management system. There is a mm -hmm. ton of resources being dedicated to both right now right now from the whole vehicle team. So that's why when people, when they're talking about how they were and it eventually happened, they were debating whether to pull resources from the band new merchantman. It's because resource management and getting squadron 42 out are such high priorities. Um, yeah. And we haven't had a big ship um, produced in a while and we're probably not going to see one produced you know, going into production besides the, the Polaris and maybe something else. I imagine we will Even see on the concept. Like when was the last big ship in concept? Yep. Yeah. We, we so haven't, they, had... pro they probably have one, at least like one for every manufacturer something near there. I would yeah. imagine. Yeah. The, the, the galaxy and the odyssey, you know, are, are big, but not like ultra. Big right. I imagine the concept for the anvil capital ship is already done. I wouldn't be surprised, but it, it, for CAG to say, hey, look, an Anvil Capital ship. How much flack are they going to get? Because one, all this stuff in uh, in the pipeline still, all the ships that aren't done, plus this ship is going to be done for X amount of time. So they're just going to keep that on the shelf till they start working on it. 
then they'll tell you about it. Yep. Um, but it's good that these things are a priority because these things are gameplay. It's a getting squadron 42, you know, uh, out the door, getting those ships ready, you know, um, and it's not just when, you know, they say squadron 42 vehicle support, they're not talking, they're, they're talking about all the vehicles, the Vanduul ships, the, those mm-hmm. sort of chopped up pirate ships that we saw, um, even UEE ships and such, you know, it's, it gets, it's, this is the gold, you know, essentially gold standard work for uh, all wrapped up into one deliverable versus saying, you know, this ship gold standard, that ship gold standard, um, you know, uh, otherwise the, the deliverables would get really, really thick, really fast. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's a good thing. But they're also working on things that are unannounced, but things that have been in concept for a while. And they're putting them into production um, after they've, you know, apparently been fully white boxed. So that's good. Um, the other thing that, that I like to see is development began on an all new small ship. I like to see them making small ships. Um, I thought the cutter, I think, I think the cutter is a great starter ship. I hope we get additional starter ships and then additional, uh, spirit esque ships, you know, two to three people. I think that's the, the lineup that really should yeah. be focused on for a little while until the squadron 42 vehicles are done and they can put the capital ships in production. Um, Make even though we have RSI ship. a number, give me, give me the, uh, cutlass RSI. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, the not cool. Connie. But not Connie. Yeah, uh, they're like the, yeah. the just less than Connie, but little more than a spot right there. Yeah. Need, needs a mm-hmm. little bit of help. Yeah, the the um, it, it, an Apollo not medical ship. You know, that sort yeah, of thing. kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like a a, a, a multi role. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just said it. Apollo. Jeez. Yeah. All right. We should probably move on. I'm going to close these for now. <laughs> I was thinking about that when I was rereading it, so I was like, "Yeah, we need to bring that up yeah. and look at those things." Absolutely, that was that was really good points there. Um, um, it is your turn with community. Let's just do art environment while we're at it, since we don't have to. So I don't have to scroll back up on the squadron for. I bit. lost it. It's right. I, I've got it right here. I'll I'll do it, and then I'll do community. Okay. Well, in that case, you- I will be right back. Okay. Um, art environment, and this is a, sh- a short one. Environment or art approached. Um, content complete. One second, mute. Uh, environment art uh, approach content complete on several chapter locations, including chapters seven and eleven. Um, seven and eleven. I wonder if they did that as a pun, you know, or, or what. Uh, asset kits are currently in progress to help flesh out spacecaping for the flight based chapters while vandal ship work continues as the as the team prepares to hand them over to be set up vandal ship work continues as the team prepares to hand them over to be set up and it's interesting that environment art is working on the vandal ships and helping out with that project so uh, that's interesting to hear i wonder you know um because when they say environment it makes me think you know of uh you know, exterior environments, um, as well as like, uh, stations and, and, um, you know, landing zones, that, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, if they're doing environment art, I wonder if the environment art teams are working on the interior of, uh, Vandal ships, um, you know, for, for the parts of the game that we end up in them or, or we see them. I don't know. Um, and then, so back to me for community on the PU side. I always enjoy the screenshots that they get for the monthly reports. Um, how do I get my character to look, um, you know, uh, uh, weathered like that guy? I, I want to have the uh, the wrinkles and the creases and all that sort of thing. Uh, the community team started November with a cargo refactor AMA, which included details of the new soft death mechanic which is fantastic. So glad that they included that. Um, They then supported the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo, IAE 2952, including publishing the Best in Show Prizes and in-depth IAE Traveler's Guide, the Free Fly Schedule, updates to the new Player Guide, and a dedicated IAE 2952 FAQ. They also launched a Drake-themed screenshot contest where players faced a unique challenge each day of the Expo. 
Following their reveals at IAE, the team curated and published Q&A posts for the Drake Cutter, the Anvil C8R Pisces, and the RSI Galaxy. Uh, in the approach to the holidays, community released the Luminalia calendar and the Luminalia 2952 referral bonus. They also supported the Luminalia screenshot contest, Luminalia holiday card contest, and Holiday Mayhem at Jumptown. In support of some of Alpha 318's lesser publicized features, pardon me, the community published three patch watch posts detailing balancing keys, uh, continued law- lawlessness, and the last, sorry, uh, latest iteration of Jumptown. The team also spent time working on a few new web-based programs and further improvements coming to the guide system, community hub, and Spectrum. Boy, does the guide system need a, a lot of work um, to, to get it functioning as intended. Um, and the community hub is a good start, but um, it, it it's missing a lot. Um, and it really just needs to have things where uh, things are automated. You know, if you post a video to your YouTube or you're streaming on Twitch, it just needs to automatically post up on there. Um, you know, the, the integration needs to not be, you know, I shouldn't have to do things manually because you know, the amount of work for doing that on the community hub and then doing it on Reddit and posting things on Twitter, um, making community posts on YouTube, you know, that, that just gets ultra time consuming. So, um, hopefully they will continue to iterate that on and improve on it. Cause it would be nice if it was sort of a one-stop shop for your star citizen content creation uh, instead of multiple sources. Um, yeah. Yeah. And on to you Nazareth for your favorite part of the monthly report, the engine. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Aren't you hilarious? Oh, I'm gonna extra big so I can actually read it. Because gosh, there's a lot of just stuff. Anyway, engine team. Now this is only technically on the Star Citizen side, but this applies to both Squadron and Star Citizen because this is the engine that both are built on top of. So, in November and December, uh, November and December were busy months for the physics team. Aside from plenty of bug fixes, fix, fixing, and support for Alpha 318, they worked on various optimizations. For example, the cost of performing an OVB versus grid cell overlap checks was optimized by performing them in one call for a grid node instead of cell by cell. That's the part of trigonometry. Um, that's actually just a check to see if uh, two different grid squares are overlapping. That's all that is. I'm so glad they optimized it. I don't really know what it's for. I assume for cargo because it's grid cells. But it's optimized now. Much better system. Hooray. Um, also, the stepping for attached and AI-controlled NPCs on the server was disabled to bring back the actor entity step performance. Uh, several internal data structures were com- compacted and re- reordered for a smaller memory footprint and better management align- or member alignment. Uh, so NPCs got better stepping data. I'm uh, not exactly sure what stepping data is, but basically better performance. Basically, everything the engine team does is better performance. And then this one I do know, the internal restructuring and stuff, um, they say straight out, smaller memory footprint, so it uses less memory. The game will use less memory, both on server and client. Uh, so that is very good. On the renderer, this one's really easy to figure out. The team enabled Gen 12 pipeline and scene rendering by default. So Gen 12 for 3.18 and beyond is on by default. This will be featured in Alpha 3.18, and many people actually have been having quite a good time with it, uh, which is a major milestone on the road towards completing the Gen 12 transition and providing a Vulkan backend. Uh, following, Following October's work on particles, further substantial progress was made. Gen 12 refraction and half-resolution rendering support for GPU particles was added, and the particle stage and GPU handler refactor, the GPU stage and particle handler refactored, refactored. The particle shader background compilation was enabled. Furthermore, particle split for each hierarchy level are now updated in a way that ensures UAV 
resources stay consistent across each patch and don't change. Or each patch. Pass and don't change. I can I can speak. Moreover, debug visualization code for various systems was ported to Gen 12, and the PSO caching for projectiles and uh, and particles was imported. And that's a lot of stuff basically saying they moved forward. Gen 12 is on by default, and a lot of particle work was done uh, to both import it and optimize it into Gen 12. Uh, this is... We are only a couple steps off of Gen 12 being finished, and then that will be a couple steps off of Vulcan being fully implemented, which is then a couple steps off of, well, basically VR. <laughs> but after they get Vulcan fully in, so like I said, after, so it's Gen 12, optimized Gen 12, Vulcan, optimized Vulcan. And then they have the headroom to look into stuff like VR and ray tracing, that, that sort of thing. And that's what this new renderer will really help them to do, is not just stagnate the visuals. Uh, a couple years ago, or last year or so, there was a question on Spectrum. How do you propose you keep up to date and always keep shooting for next-gen hardware? The Gen 12 render is that thing. So in 10 to 12 years, sure, they might need to update their pipeline again, but this takes advantage of even the 40 series level of cards. And especially when we get into trying to run it at 90 frames in VR, which renders it twice at least. Or trying to do ray tracing. Like, it's going to be really heavy, especially even on the newer cards that are still in the process of releasing. Uh, regarding atmosphere and volumetric clouds, an initial draft of the new temporal render node was submitted and will continue to be worked on in the coming months to provide better rendering performance of ray march volumetric clouds and atmosphere. Furthermore, various options for refined cloud shaping were brainstormed with tech art and will hopefully find their way into a release soon. So ray march as its name said what? I, I'm I know that they've been working on the, the little dot pixelation stuff for, for clouds and addressing that issue. Um, and I'm hoping that they find you know, a fix for that because I, I know it isn't everybody, you know, cause I see screenshots and I'm like, yeah, my clouds don't look like that. How do you get your clouds to look like that? You know, and it seems like it's a, some sort of rendering issue. Um, and I don't know what it is. And, uh, Oh, cause I get those little flickering clouds as well. Yeah. Hmm. The, the 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 pixelation like if you look at it especially in certain lights it's very apparent where you see lots of you know dots it looks like a you know if you're looking really closely at a, a color comic strip you know the the, the sort yeah. of almost dot matrix printing yeah it looks like that mm -hmm. yeah but ray march is a kind of ray trace or ray it is a so ray whenever you see ray in anything to do with programming it is all runs back to it is a data calculation that shoots a laser beam from a point to another point and ca and catches data on the way there. So with path tracing, the big brother of ray tracing, that line is cast, I think, f depending on how you do it from the camera or from the light, and it continues to calculate different trajectories as it bounces off servers, collecting data as it goes. Ray marching is similar, but it stops at every whatever they're marching through every sequence or every step and collects data there. So for volumetric clouds, it would say, OK, from here to here, um, it should fade this much from here to here it should fade this much. And so it's marching through gathering this data so that it renders correctly on your screen. And then it says oh, various options were also refined uh, cloud shaping and brainstorm tech. Uh, also, lots so temporal. That's time-based uh, node they're working on. So hopefully, a lot more performance, performance and better visuals for clouds coming, as they said, in a release soon. So three nineteen or beyond, I would imagine, since they mentioned three eighteen previously in the uh, in the section. Uh, moving on to the core engine. The team completed work on V2 of P4K data file support. Uh, for those who don't know, P4K is your base game file. Um, that's not specific to Star System, as far as I know. That is just literally the game file itself. So when 
se leaks or someone rips into the the folder of star or the files of star citizen it's that file that they're uncompressing and reading what that one file has inside because it's basically an entire game within the one file um so it says the version 2 of the p4k data file support for the engine game and tool side on that note the system now provides an efficient look or lock mechanism for legacy pack files, as well as much faster access to files inside pack files embedded in the main P4K data file. So yay, um, programs can, or the game can access itself faster. That's always a better uh, scenario. And I'm glad that they still are finding ways to improve it. Both of which significantly improve the loading of object containers. So why do we need to load object containers faster, Trey? To have better performance. Oh, so who, what, what system uses, uh, what is it? Uh, object containers to, oh. what core tech uses object containers? Persistent entity streaming. And server meshing. And server meshing, yes. Like that's, that's how server meshing is going to work. It's going to, the authority is over not just an item, but a mm-hmm. item or an object container. Yep. And or the faster object container that... or an object zone, entity zone, entity container. Yep. Yep. All the same thing. So that significant improvement will significantly improve what they can do with server meshing. Mm-hmm. Additionally, the mapping of threads on Intel CPUs with the, I forget what they call it, efficiency and performance cores. Or I was so excited to read this written. because I am Critical one of the victims. Such... Of this. Oh, okay. I, 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 I posted about CPU, this all over so. the place because I got so excited. I have a 12900K. Nice. So 12th mm. and 13th, gen, 13th generation CPUs are victims of this. And it appears to not be everybody. And I don't know why some people get it and other people don't. I think it's probably a motherboard thing um, and uh, some sort of motherboard difference in motherboard controllers. But I have no way of knowing. But right now, Star Citizen treats... Um, 12th and 13th gen CPUs, Intel CPUs, um, like previous generation CPUs, where they're, uh, well, all all cores were performance cores. Well, uh, 12th and 13th gen CPUs have performance cores and efficiency cores. And um, they do this because the efficiency cores um, are much smaller, uh, both like physically smaller, um, and they require much less power uh, but that way you are able to do like background tasks and, and other, you know, operating system level things um, with your efficiency cores while, you know, using less power and uh, creating less heat and leaving your, um, your your performance cores to do the things that you need performance cores to do, regardless of what you're doing. And it works well when you're just doing standard tasks. Unfortunately, it is not good for gaming because games uh, and game engines just treat all cores the same. Uh, And so the Star Citizen is like the first game that is actually addressing this um, because it was making it was a huge issue for the way their engine works because they're basically rewriting their engine, you know, from the ground up. Um, And it was causing a ton of stuttering by you would have... um, tasks assigned to efficiency cores um, taking too long and so uh, in order for a scene to render uh, and on, uh, on the render thread and for things to update they would be waiting on these efficiency cores after the performance core has already done this thing and so the stuttering made the game dang near unplayable in, in certain areas you you'd be running around one area and be fine and smooth and then another area that was more resource intensive would just be you know um uh, like a rapid fire um, slideshow. Um, mm. And it was super, super, super annoying. And the only fix was basically to turn off your efficiency, make sure to uh, turn off your efficiency cores for the Star Citizen application. Uh, either you could turn them off entirely, which would mean you wouldn't have them when you were doing other things outside of playing Star Citizen. Um, I use a program called Process Lasso that just makes it so when Star Citizen launches, Star Citizen has access to all my performance cores, but that way my efficiency cores are still available for running Windows, running Discord, doing other things, um, which is great for playing Star Citizen. (laughs) Yeah, and it's great for playing Star Citizen, um, and it makes my gameplay experience normal. Uh, The only issue is then Star Citizen 
hogs the performance scores um, and will take up basically everything on the performance scores. And so I can't, um, I can't single PC stream because mm. uh, OBS um, will be trying to stream for me and is relegated to efficiency cores. Um, and then it causes issues with my stream. And so it, and right now my capture card, my external capture card has audio issues. So I can't use it to stream to my laptop Oof. and have that do the stream for me with OBS. So it's a, that's why I haven't been part of the reason I haven't been streaming SC is because uh, of these two issues. If my capture card was working, it would be, it would be fine. If I didn't have this issue with my CPU, I could, you know, single PC stream just fine. Um, but I have both. So it, it's a, a, a big pain in my butt and I'm not happy about it. So reading about this and hearing that it's being tested in the PTU right now gives me hope because this will probably get fixed faster than Elgato um, RMAs my capture card and sends me a new one, <laughs> even though I've been fighting with them on it for months. Ouch. Yep. All right. Um, and then to finish off what it actually says for that is critical threads such as the main thread, run thread, and network threads are, are ensured to always run on performance cores to avoid otherwise poor performance affected or unaffected CPUs. These changes are currently being verified on the PTU, as Tree said. Also, support for page size larger than 4 kilobytes, aka huge pages, uh, was added to the uh, added to the engine at the moment on Linux only. So those Linux users have a, a thing to their own. Uh, it's currently used for stacks, uh, text, and data segments, as well as physics allocations which is kind of a big deal. Using huge pages reduces the pressure on the TLB cache, uh, the part of the CPU translate, uh, translating the virtual to physical addresses, which would help with performance, What should help with performance. So basically, it's the uh, translating the data onto your RAM. So from a digital thing, saying this should be here, and then taking the address and saying, you live here on the RAM. So basically, imagine the RAM as a neighborhood and the cpu is trying to house all the data so big bigger pages is basically buses instead of taxi uh with clang and i don't know if that's a wire term the only way i know clang is from um space engineers and that was a very bad thing with uh problems with physics calculation but i don't think that's this in here anyway with clang just moving the text segment to huge pages gave a 7% speed up as a lot for just having more data in one boat. Furthermore, the latest version of Blink 2 was integrated for a new audio for a few audio related bug fixes. The latest version of Blink 2 was integrated and a few audio related bugs fixed in the video playback, uh, manifesting themselves as a random click during playback. So that's interesting. Glad it was fixed. Uh, another area that progressed well was the remote shader compile compile server used to build shader caches, uh, or shader caches, etc. I guess due to the increased usage of the server by development teams, the build process proper build process proper support to fallback agents, as well as server throttling, was implemented to deal with the times of extreme load and to allow for more for distributed compilation. At this point, it also yeah, it also made sense to rewrite various parts of the code, server code, to allow for more robustness, better logging, and increased performance. Lastly, shape unification was also completed, and entity area support was added. A copy paste bug in the entity aggregate manager that caused a lot of unnecessary memory access was fixed, and viz area loading was refactored to support branch support branch conversation. Or yeah, batch convert, convert, conversion, and various versions <laughs> of stylized viz areas. I can read, I swear. Um, but the shader server, something that's something we do not touch as players. That's specifically an internal dev build. Basically, they have to compute shaders. They throw it over to a server to compute it, and then get it back. That's now something we use because we have to do the shader compilation at runtime. They need to do it in much larger areas and 
larger packs of shaders. So basically, if they fix something in shaders or change a shader, they have to send the entire, like, all of the shaders, if they touch all the shaders, basically all the shaders they need to, they need to validate them at a much larger scale than using each shader in whatever real-time scenario we're in. So they have a server, so it doesn't stop them working on it. They can just say, okay, I've fixed the shader, throw it over to the server, and they'll get it back later. So super cool. Uh, and then lastly, the remainder of the time was spent supporting Alpha 318. So that would be... Where are we at now? Features Arena Commander? That is correct, Amundo. All right. Nicely done, sir. All right. Um... Oh, you changed it around. See, now it's updated. Like I said, I moved um, our environment, and then you said, no, 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 we'll just keep going. So just, 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 you're on Arena Commander, so go. Okay, I'll do it. Got it. Uh, Arena Commander feature team. The majority of the team's end-of-the-year focus was on making final improvements for Alpha 318. Work continued on the classic race refactor, including taking the Snake Pit, Euterpe Icebreaker, and Miner's Lament courses to play te to play testable states. Um, this allowed features to collect feedback from several other teams. A refactor of the race manager and checkpoint system then began with the aim to create a more robust, future-proof system that can be used by the PU teams to create races around the verse. Design also began developing additional variants of holographic checkpoints and directional arrows for each track, which will vary in style to best suit the setting. Finally, for racing, work was completed on the old Vanderval Rickard Memorial Raceway and Defford Link racetracks. So, I don't do any racing. I have questions. Um, is this... So, are, are all the new tracks that are in the PU also available for racing in Arena Commander? The, the I don't know way? if they're available yet, but that will be the plan. Okay, so that's what, is that what this is saying that they're working on? Yes, there's also I don't know where they mentioned it, but they're working on a tool uh -huh. to specifically build, um, or have like be able to copy paste locations out of PU into Arena Commander. Okay, and Old Vanderval Rickard Memorial Raceway and Defford Link racetracks are those the old ones from the race mode the or classic ones yeah yeah, yeah classic yeah. okay so finally for racing work was completed on so this is their their reworks of those um mm -hmm. that they're saying they completed okay their updates yeah gotcha improvements were made to the new front end including a new window for game mode selection and updated style and the restoration of single player using a rewritten lobby system that also supports multiplayer uh, this allows other teams to use the new front end arena commander feature stream for greater feedback Interesting. Um, it's nice that, that single player not mode not in is... PTU. <laughs> yeah. It's nice that single player mode is back, though. Um, investigation then began into adding turrets to the Jericho Station and Dying Star maps to either assist or hinder the player in Vandal and Pirate Swarm game modes. That'll be uh, interesting if you're flying around doing those things and you have to dodge, you know... Um, you know, turret fire, you know, either mm -hmm. coming at you or, or shooting, um, you know, trying to help. <laughs> um, yeah. I wonder, yeah. Um, work was also done to speed up and ease the process of taking locations from the Persistent Universe and have them featured as maps in Arena Commander, which is currently being used for several upcoming racetracks. There you go. Um, uh, North End Trooper says Arena Commander updates could not uh, get here soon enough. I agree completely. Absolutely. Uh, so about the single player thing, single player has been a thing. It's the private match that hasn't been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the team supported the soft death feature. Interesting that they are helping out with that. Uh, refactor mm -hmm. of the game rules rounds module began which allows Star Marine's last stand mode to have multiple rounds. This refactor enables it uh, in all game modes should the design team choose. Dual mode will be the first to utilize this and will allow players to begin a new round with a restocked ship after each kill. Pardon me. Uh, work yeah, was also completed on the... Good. Yeah, on the rework system. Pardon me. Used to ban or allow vehicles and weapons in each game mode. 
this system provides greater customization for the developers, such as setting up a new mode that only allows a certain vehicle. This is used in Alpha 318 during filtered dual mode, squadron battle, and battle royale to only allow small and medium combat ships. The first pass on new death cameras, which point to the player that killed you while moving and zooming dynamically, was submitted and enabled for all game modes too. Finally, work was submitted for an unannounced update to a classic arena commander mode, which will be further detailed in the coming months. Finally, work was submitted for an unannounced update to a classic arena commander mode, which will be further detailed in the uh, coming months. What do you think that is? It's not racing because they already talked about that. Yeah. It's not dual because they already talked about that. Squadron battle, battle royale, it's all. Is it the swarm mode? I don't know. It's interesting they're being like, so that's cheeky like... about it. You know, yeah, like that's like the only the mode I can think of. Mm. I don't know. It, it, whatever it is, they seem, you know, they're, they're hyping it up and they seem pretty proud of it. So it'll be interesting to see what it is they're talking about. Um, so I, I, I'm very curious. You know, and they they specify Arena Commander, not Star Marine or anything else. Right. So very uh, interesting. So are we just gonna alternate, and you'll do the things that I was going to do, and vice versa. Are you gonna? Yeah, do... I think I have most of it fixed once it finally gets to you and updates. Okay. So features, character, and weapons. Back to you. And um, I am going to use the restroom real quick. Uh, it looks like it's all just PU, right? Yep. Yep. All right. So throughout November, the team added support for the tractor beam snapping or tractor beam snapping boxes onto the cargo grid. Hmm. Is that the handheld one? It doesn't say the handheld one. It says tractor beams. Anyway, I imagine it's all tractor beams, including the handheld. This include a holographic preview to assist with moving loot into a ship. And it's not just loot. It's also like cargo. But anyway. They also revisited the feature behind dragging to an unconscious body into the medical bed. This is being made more generic so that bodies can be placed into other appropriately sized objects. As a part of this, several improvements are being made to the flow itself to make it more robust and forgiving. Yay, stuffing people in other places. I imagine that should also be part of stealth. And if you take down uh, NPCs, you can hide them in things, kind of like be in Hitman, as I say every time stealth comes into the uh, uh, the conversation. Uh, the team also supported an upcoming patch release with improvements to player spawn and reconnection flow. Um, additional time was spent ensuring all new inventory UI features were working as expected too. I want to kill a van duel in stealth and then jam the van duel into an air vent. So that way, when the van duel are patrolling around checking the air vents, they find their dead comrade. And then I want to see their reaction. That's <laughs> okay. the only thing I need from Squadron 42 now. Okay. Make it happen. That's a goals, you know, good to have goals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, the team then investigated issue logs for bugs that caused the UI to load indefinitely with fixes being added to the build. On the technical animation side, and additional features were added in the inverse kinematics IK system to allow for more of the mocap, for co mocap performance to come through. This will help when adjusting limbs via IK while doing actions such as pressing buttons or manipulating weapon attachments. These kinds of dynamic IK-driven adjustments are required to avoid enforcing very strict metrics to en environments, weapons, and gadgets. Um, I forget where they mentioned it recently. It might be later on in the uh, the reports um, that they are currently working on the push button. Oh, no, I read it on the roadmap. They're currently working on the uh, system where your character will push all the buttons in the cockpit when you hit a key. So basically... R mm -hmm. is to get flight ready. So you should be able to hit R and they hit buttons on the dashboard. Same thing. So that is the thing. And also they're using it in Squadron. I don't know if it's already submitted for Squadron, but manipulating weapon attachments to actually put on like the scope onto the weapon, take it off and put it back onto the character. 
that kind of thing uh, okay. is now supported at least in part at least it's going into squadron first is what i mean there we go so yeah that is one of the things i can't wait to see um then we got feature gameplay you one second all right so gameplay features uh, toward the end of the year, gameplay features worked on hull scraping for Alpha 318, including reacting to feedback threads on Spectrum and adjusting gameplay to match the goals for the first iteration of Salvage. Uh, additionally, filler station functionality was expanded to allow players to create several useful items for hull scraping. I'm, I'm actually glad that they included that for now, uh, just because it's a quality of life thing. Um, you know, if you forgot to bring a pyro multi-tool with the tractor beam attachment mm -hmm. and you can't move the the crate that is created and therefore then can't make more salvage you know uh, now you can just make more you know create the tool and make more and it's just a little quality of life thing it's totally temporary this is not the way it's going to be in the future but it allows people to continue to test the game feature you know even though uh, we are well I don't want to say we, me, I, I am forgetful and I forget the dang tools that I need to do the dang job every damn time. So, I mean, fun fact, you can also load up a vulture into arena commander and you can salvage and you can make a multi-tool in arena commander. Nice. <laughs> so that's uh, a thing. Yeah. Uh, the team also continued with resource management, um, which we are seeing including life support and artificial gravity. This included a redesign of the previous engineering UI last seen at CitizenCon to give a clear, more modern design to support the vast amount of functionalities that will be expected. Um, so uh, I talked about this with multiple people. I posted about this multiple places because uh, I got super excited about it. Um, if you have, if you do what Nazareth and I do and routinely go back and, and sift through the years of conversations and design documents and stuff um, regarding Star Citizen. Um, you may have seen uh, some of the conversations that were heard, some of the concept art that they've made before, uh, the older design documents for things like engineering gameplay. They have had big plans for engineering gameplay for a very long time. Um, and now it is finally coming into fruition and they're building the systems to support it and will continue to add more and more functionality um, as, you know, once the system is built you know, and gets started. But um, I'm exceedingly excited for resource management, gameplay, engineering gameplay, um, because compared to what, you know, vast is a bit of a buzzword, but it, this is in relation to what other space games have. Instead of just having a simplistic power triangle, you know, um, or, or no engineering gameplay whatsoever, the engineering gameplay that will be available in Star Citizen, particularly for larger ships, will be vast by comparison. Um, it, it's meant to be its own core gameplay loop. And so if you think about how you complex should, should mining to... is at this stage, and they're not even close to being done with mining, well, you yeah. know, this is the way, this is the way Star Citizen is. So if... You know, if you haven't wrapped your head around the concept that CIG does not do anything simplistic um, or, or rudimentary, um, you, you know, buckle your seatbelts. That's tier zero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never has that been a thing in Star Citizen's uh, development. So uh, additionally, groundwork began for vehicle tractor beams. Thank goodness. Um, the next steps will be creating the tractor beam UI and expanding the feature to support its proper functionalities. Um, so the good thing is that they already have a basis to start. Um, so when the people, I, I know people have read this, I'm like, oh, they're just starting the groundwork for it. It's going to take forever. No, we have tractor beam functionality in game. It's just smaller. They do have to do some work on it because it's coming out of a turret and it's attached to a ship and it's moving much larger things. So they will have to iterate on that tractor beam tech and they are going to need to provide, you know, make UI just like they needed to make UI for the salvaging via ships versus the pyro multi-tool so if you think about that you know that that's the the kind of work that they're needing to do um but not to the same extent um just also, because this was two months old yeah <laughs> this is two months old um you know and they have done a lot of this work already so um you know the, the interesting thing that will be 
uh, will remain to be seen is, you know, we already see the, you know, tractor beaming crates and, you know, doing that with bigger crates isn't going to be that big of a deal, you know, and making the, the, that all snap to onto cargo grids and such with uh, tractor beam turrets, like on the Taurus or whatever. The bigger question is they're building the Argo SRV right now. The Argo SRV uses vehicle tractor beams to tow ships and other large objects, including crates. Um, so they that's the work that they're you know really needing to get done is how do you use tractor beams to impact larger objects, things larger and carrying more mass uh, and, and overall size than just cargo crates um, or, or other items. So... It's a, a significant expansion in functionality, but they do have a good basis to work with. And so, and PES is in, um, you know, all, all the tech that would get in the way of this stuff is all, all in. So I, I don't think it's going to take them a long time uh, by any stretch of the word to get vehicle tractor beams in and, and working at least in a, a state where we can have it in the, the live game. You know, obviously there's still going to be bugs and stuff and, you know, it'll fling things into the, Stanton star and end the universe, but, um, you know, it, it, I'm looking forward to playing around with these. Uh, the mining update continued with the changes made to the Argo mole and miss prospector to create bigger differences between the individual and multiplayer aspects. The first rebalancing pass was done for all mining heads, sub items and gadgets to support the updated approach to resource distribu di distribution. This involves new variances for mineables to ensure they're distributed in a more controlled fashion throughout Stanton and supporting future crafting releases. This is a very interesting statement. Um, a, I, I really like that they are doing more to differentiate between the, the mole and the prospector, make it isn't, you know, so it isn't just, you know, uh, three prospectors equals a mole, you know, that's a sort of rudimentary thing. I want to see, you know, the, Using a big shift, a bigger ship has an advantage over just using many small ships, regardless of whether it's mining, combat, salvage, the, the whole thing. There needs to be a advantage uh, to, to doing it that way. They, they need to further incentivize multi-crew in multiplayer using bigger ships to do these jobs in order to you know, get people to work together, but also get you to progress beyond just owning a prospector you know you're, you're wanting to progress up to the mole but if you do that you know you need to you know progress in your social life and make friends to use the ship with or hire npcs yeah um yeah. so that there's, the, the, there's a, a lot of thing. design there's a lot of design videos that talk about social design where it doesn't where it's social social sociality i don't know if that's a thing is just a, as big as a mechanic as mining or cargo so when you start the game, you might not have a lot of friends, but the social mechanics of the game will help you and to train you to better communicate with your fellow citizens so that you can level up your social ability and have friends and do these bigger missions and more and higher payouts and longer missions and et cetera, et cetera. So basically literally leveling up your social ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, leveling out up without getting a, an update on your screen that says your character is leveled up. You know, press here to yeah, literally proceed leveling to spend you your up. character points. Part of the crew. Yeah. Part of the ship. Part of the crew. Part of the right ship. Right before we go on. Part, part of the crew. Part, part of the ship. Man. Part uh, of the crew. Part of the ship. Ether. Um, Ether drift. That's why there's such a resistance to crafting. It's not resistance to crafting, as far as I've been, uh, as far as I've observed. It's specifically a resistance to the put an amount of raw metal in get a completed multi-tool out um which is the, the hackiest way to do it and that's it's just because it's a stopgap piece of tech and not mm -hmm. a crafting it's not star citizen crafting it's just a stopgap um even me i don't like this i don't like it i understand it needs to be there for a stopgap i do not like it because not, it, not a on the multi tool, thing. there's wires and different kinds of metal, mm -hmm. and it's some complex thing. And Grey Cat owns the design. There's no amount of money that you can pay that Drake was able to pay Grey Cat to say, yeah, we can just let all of our people make infinite amount of these things, right? Not a thing. It is completely gamified stopgap that should not exist. 
but it needs to for now. Um, crafting, when it comes in, will be amazing when it comes in. This is not crafting. This is way too bad to be crafting. But yeah. as we, crafting as we just needs said, to be complex recipe systems. And right. that's for root. You know, I, I don't think we are going to see crafting beyond um, building structures from blueprints that are given, you know, that you have to, you know, or earn in, in some way, shape or form mm -hmm. and crafting, you know, and that's really construction. I think, I, I think it's important to separate construction and crafting. Um, yeah. And I, for crafting, I don't think we're going to get anything beyond usables. You know, I, I think that you might be allowed to craft uh, batteries and ammunition, um, you know, things that are, are consumed by, either your character or the devices that you use. I don't see us, you know, being able to craft our own ship components because Arc Corps would lose their mind and send an army of lawyers after you. So I actually talked about this back on the Astropod Discord on, I believe it was the 10th of last month. So December 10th. Um, and the also, thought I came um, up with... Tech Zero, thank you for the follow. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. I don't know why the sound played... But the little GIF animation did not. Because it's probably not on the right layer on this scene. Um, oh. <laughs> it's always something. It's always I something. thought I had it working. Um, but the, the idea I came up with was being able to, once you had a good rep good enough reputa reputation, buying a limited stock blueprint. So let's say, let's say the Grey Cat multi-tool. So you get good enough in with Grey Cat that you're able to buy a, a data pad that has, you can build 10 multi-tools out of it. And you put that in whatever manufacturer uh, vehicle you have, and you're able to produce 10 multi-tools. And that way it's not a, here's an infinite key to build as many consumables as you want, or tools as you want, but it also gives us the ability to build stuff to sell. So it kind of helps in that whole manufacturing loop for the player. Mm -hmm. so that's the idea i came up with during that and there was nice back and forth during that so shout out to uh the astro pub and the captain's table all right so let's see how uh, that i have all my windows messed around uh mission feature team or yeah mission feature team yeah mission features good team. yep and it's all pu yeah okay yep uh let's see so mission features spent the end of last year enhancing and Erecting improvements to, and bug fixes to missions in Alpha 318, including issues seen on YouTube, Twitch, Reddit, and Spectrum alongside the issue council reports. Yes, they have time and they do look for these things everywhere. If they're just randomly watching Twitch and they see a bug, they're like, aha, let's make a ticket for that. So you guys can too. If you're watching a stream, watching a video, scrolling Twitter or wherever, and you see someone have a bug, you can put that on the issue council. That's a thing you can do. So definitely help them out. They're also working on doing some work on the issue council to better have their devs be able to use it and have it easier to kind of use on their end. So definitely go use the issue council because it really helps them out. And it is something only few games have. Uh, let's see. Also, using feedback from Evocati in Wave 1 PTU, they also implemented analytic events into time trial missions and began analyzing the results to balance the mission target times. Which, yes, we now have a clock and time trials in the Persistent Universe in 318. This data is also being used to determine the final unlock order for when mission, pro pro mission progression is implemented. This these analytics review <clears throat> these analytics review the reviewing the balance will continue until it's live. So still time for that to change. Uh, let's see. Additionally, the ground where nope, that's that was that end. I scrolled up. Okay. Uh, for security post Korea, the team addressed an issue with the secret item hmm, not working correctly. They also changed the way the data pad on the security chief spawned and adjusted the turrets as they were respawning too quickly. The trespass timer length was also increased. The team are currently looking into an issue with missions not generating for Crusader mercenaries uh, mercenary scope so 
and are continuing to investigate other known issues that have been raised. And I refer you to the beginning of this thing. They said YouTube, Twitch, Reddit, Spectrum, and Issue Council. That's where they've been raised. So you guys see bugs, report them at least somewhere. Best place to report them is the Issue Council. And then it's on to you for vehicle features, both Squadron and Star Citizen. All righty. Uh, let's see. We'll start with the PU side of things. Uh, the vehicle feature team. The vehicle feature team worked towards porting the transit system to Alpha 318's new persistent tech system. Um, yeah, it's uh, still a work in progress. Most of the core tech was completed before the holidays, though some improvements continue to be implemented. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Uh, most recently, they allowed trains to slow down and wait for transit ahead of them on the track. This should fix issues with trains overlapping. So the issue with this is the old transit system um, didn't work with PES. It didn't stream in and out. It was just constantly running, whether there are player there, players there or not. And now, um, not only does the transit system stream in and out um, when there are not players there, but it, think of the, the the trains and other things kind of like um, subsumption NPCs and uh, virtual NPCs in that they stream out and they're no longer being um, run on the dedicated game server, but they're still being run virtually. Um, so they're not in game, but they're being run virtually on a the, the transit system service. So that way, um, actual like Quanta, you know, and, and VNPCs can still use them to move about um it, it, on the back end you know so it's it's you you can't see it but it's still there um it's it's really interesting uh, one of those things where it's like i never would have thought that was going to be an issue but apparently it is um but they also have to make sure that when players come back that it streams back in and functions as if it never left you know it, it just um continues to work just like it was already working on the back end so it just comes and goes now the and team also the planet <laughs> and doesn't fall through the planet, doesn't, you know, crush you or kill you or lock you inside. Um, yeah. The team also implemented new setup tools for vehicles, which allow the designers to see how the automated thruster algorithms use each thruster on a ship. This is used to see how certain thrusters are being used, uh, to are being used to move in specific directions and make necessary changes to get ships to fly how they want. They actually talked about this in, I think it was that SEL, um, uh, the all vehicle uh, star system live. We talked about how they developed this, uh, this tool, uh, and made it so that way it's, uh, much easier for developers to, to tune the, the flight of ships to get the feel that they want, um, during development rather than having to do so much of the work afterwards. Hopefully this will mean less, uh, maneuverability, you know, buffs and nerfs and coming and going, yeah. um, for vehicle features on squadron 42 side, Let's scroll that up a little bit. Uh, the last two months of the year saw vehicle features largely completing a full rework of quantum travel. Largely completing a full rework of quantum travel, which is being integrated into Squadron 42 for testing. So they've largely completed the work for Squadron you know, um, uh, uh, for the rework for Squadron 40 or for quantum travel. They're implementing it into Squadron 42 for testing. After it has been tested and uh, fully implemented over there, we will it'll get moved over to the PU. The question is how much work will be involved in order to move it over to the PU. We really don't know because we don't know if this is just the system and then there will be a lot more work um, as far as iterating on it for ships in the PU that are not in Squadron 42. We don't know if it's a holistic system and it's not so much the visuals um, that remains to be seen. But it's good that they're making so much progress on revamping that system. Uh, this continues from the quantum boost feature mentioned in previous reports and significantly improves the overall feature implementation. Ah, this is very good. They also supported the VFX team in integrating new effects for quantum travel. So the VFX team is already working on the new uh, the new uh, effects for quantum travel. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see what else they end up doing in order to update it for, for other ships. But the this is a very good thing to stop hitching. <laughs> yeah. Quantum travel is so janky right now and it needs to, you know, <laughs> it needs to stop doing that. It, it even does that on, it does that on my computer. 
I have a 12, 900 K and a 30, 90, you know, it, it just hitches no matter who you are. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're running, you know, a supercomputer from the future. Um, they also worked on a recall feature. We saw this button on a, um, the Moby glass preview from a few months back, mm-hmm. uh, available to various, yep. A very available to various military ships in the game. This uses the AI pathfinding tech using the PU and will allow various Squadron 42 levels to be completed. Aha, uh-huh, very interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, the yeah, I imagine specifically then... what we saw in the vertical slice the first time. Yep. You went mm-hmm. through all of that. You're not going to track all the way back out. You're going to be, okay, got her. Hit the thing. Get your ship to come around. How are they getting her out? Hold on. They came into Gladius. There's not a second scene in that. They had a they just rescued the the advocacy agent. That's what the um, item storage is for. She's very flexible <laughs> and and shorter than you think. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if you like on your way out, you find a thing for her to steal. Yeah. Hmm. But no, you're gonna have to disable the AA first. So that's definitely not the end of that mission. There's so much more mission in that mission. Mm-hmm. So much more mission mm. in that mission. Uh, let's see. The vehicle features then completed a significant refactor of the aiming system and are currently working with the uh, with UI to implement new aiming reticles and pips to go alongside it. This will result in a in huge improvements in aiming accuracy and reliability. It's currently being tested to improve the combat experience. So, the refactor is done and it's being tested. And you know, once they like how you know, how it works. Then it'll get implemented in the PU. You know, that is great. That is significant progress. This is why, you know, the the reports for the Squadron 40, you know, the Squadron 42 reports are written this way in order to explain to everybody, it's like, oh, all this work on Squadron 42, they took those teams, you know, and now there's no progress on the PU. Well, yes, there is plenty of progress on the PU, but this is all stuff that is on both games. And they're just, they're still doing the work. It is still occurring. It's just being tested in Squadron 42 first and then brought over. So that way it's a more polished thing beforehand. And yeah, it's, it takes a little bit longer to get it in the PU, but it's, you know, comes into the PU in a better state, you know, but if people. Yeah, no more carts with nothing to put on them. (laughs) Yeah. If people read the reports, they would understand this, you know, and understand that's why they write the reports in order to say, hey, it's working. The, the process is working. CIG knows it's working. Everybody who reads these critically knows it's working, but people who don't read and don't come and hang out on the Pathfinders podcast or listen to Paul Shelley, you know, read the monthly reports. Um, they don't know that. And it's a disservice, unfortunately. Anyway, that's my rant. Uh, significant time towards the end of 2022 went into the multifunction display, heads up display and vehicle UI reworks. The base MFD system is making huge strides and we've partially implemented most of the core MFD screens for ships using the new building block system. We're just starting to build the new HUD, which deeply integrates with the MFD system with configuration options and MFD casting options. Uh, uh, Again, awesome that they're making such great progress on these three features um, that will make it not only a lot more performant, but a lot more user friendly um, and, you know, uh, uh, look a whole lot better. Um, so this is something that they'll be continuing on with this throughout the year, but I imagine we will be seeing, um, this, uh, getting completed, uh, for squadron 42 over the next several months, um, you know, mid year or so with, you know, testing phase. And hopefully they'll be working on porting it over to the PU before the end of the year. But this is, this is really good. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it because you know that they're going to be showing this off because it's all the new building block stuff. It's going to look super pretty and polished, um, Good stuff. Uh, this last paragraph is one of the main paragraphs in the monthly reports that I was very interested in, and I'll talk about why here in a minute. Uh, control services continued development, and in the last two months, the team improved stalling and transitions. For example, when a ship detects it's about to stall, it can automatically enable thrusters to stop it from falling. Similarly, when a ship has detected it's going fast enough to dis- uh, sustain control service flight, it can automatically shut down its maneuvering thrusters and start flying solely with control surfaces. This is greatly improving the atmospheric flight sections of the campaign. So they are building the flight sim aspects of Star Citizen 
uh, as part of the campaign, the Squadron 42 campaign, and then bringing it over to you know the PU. But the fact that they're working on this is uh, a, you know really great because um, once they get the system in, they get it polished. They'll be working on it for other ships, making sure it's working. But this is a two-part system where uh, enabling this is what will also enable um, them to work, uh, continue work on the thruster efficiency curves in order to uh, significantly differentiate between ships with VTOL thrusters and those without. So they, 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 you know, when they talk about stalling, you know, you'll be able to fly, 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 you know, and as you, you know, don't have enough lift from your forward momentum, the ship will automatically turn on your, um, your maneuvering thrusters, you know, and then you only have so much time, you know, once you're in a, you know, um, to, to use those, uh, based off of how much lift they need to provide. Um, so that it's, it's a really great system and I'm really looking forward to seeing it come into the game because as many of you may know, I'm a huge fan of drop ships. Number one being the Valkyrie best ship in the game. It's amazing. Anyone who says otherwise is, is wrong. Um, but I'm really a big, sh- uh, I'm a fan of any ship with VTOLs because I think spaceships that come and go down to the planet, um, other than fighters with wings need VTOLs. I think it needs to be a thing. And some of them have rotating ones like the Valkyrie, and a lot of them have dedicated VTOLs just sitting on the belly of the ship purely for generating lift and mostly for landing. You know, think Carrick, think Odyssey, uh, those sorts of ships. Um, So yeah, I'm I'm very excited for that more in-depth, in-atmosphere, in-gravity flight model. Um, And this is uh, the first step of a really a big two-step process that's going to make atmospheric flight feel a lot better um, and be more on par with where space-based flight is. And that is it for vehicle features. Uh, over to you for a gameplay story. Woot. Woot. All right, so gameplay story worked on a range of different tasks during November and December, including preparing and shooting mocap to update various scenes. Oh, and this is for squad. No uh, star citizen for gameplay story teams. Uh, mocap from previous shoots was also used, for example, uh, to help characters climb back into ships after speaking with players. Uh, a scene in Chapter 8 was updated to ensure the character could interact with a variety of props instead of just performing visual inspections. Interesting. The team made sure that characters used AI poses to allow them to break out of the scene if needed. Uh, the character also interact- interacts well with the Argram PUV. <coughs> that would... uh, meaning that they can fly into the Idris before starting their scene. Cool. Uh, let's see. They also. Another area further explored was unholstering and holstering. I think we talked about this earlier in the, po- in the, in the reports. This time, the team were able to make a character grab the multi tool and data pad from the exact position it attaches to the character and place it back. Actually grabbing them and placing them back so your loadout is no longer a like just detached amount of uh, items. This will eventually be the feature or work on the feature that lets your character actually grab stuff off and put it on the gun or clips or whatever. Yeah, Everything instead of generic animations, you know, it's actually yeah. going to the location of the thing. Mm-hmm. The, the, so the part that I'm confused about is like everybody wears a backpack. How does it get in the Some backpack? Keyboard. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's 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 for CIG to know. I have to find magic, out. Magic, magic backpack. Magic. It's kind of like the magic school mm. bus, but it's a backpack now. I wonder if they can like hit like like it just opens up from the top, just drop it in. Mm-hmm. Your That's backpack is like actually suggest. a um, mimic. Um, it, it's a, a mimic familiar. <laughs> and you're like, hey, I need this, and it goes Bleh, and you catch it, and yeah, nice. Yeah. I approve. I very much approve. <laughs> uh, let's see. A number of updates were also made to the characters in chapter four and eight. This involved utilizing the latest female walk cycle to en- enable the AI to seamlessly enter and exit scenes. 
Uh, also, a significant update was made in a scene in Chapter 13 with the team adjusting animations to work with the full geometry of the level. So, that is to say, Chapter 13, or at least a level in Chapter 13, is geometry complete. Read into these. Always read into these. Making it so char the character can speak to the player from better position, from a better position. And a major review of the scenes that had been worked on throughout the past year were was done too. So reviews are done for a lot of this is animation work, but for, by whatever the gameplay story team has under its belt, reviews were done for all scenes that have been done over the past year. This led to an increased animation quality, either by reusing the latest mocap or fixing what was already in place. Many new animations were created and polished passes were done on animation to further improve scenes alongside general maintenance and bug fixes. Lots of animation stuff, lots of stuff getting done. Um, I forget where like my favorite sentence in this thing was done. Um, but there, yeah, a lot of stuff in Squadrons getting done. And I I really expect to see and hear something about it this year as far as a, a either major milestone being hit or a like not not a, not a release date that's not what i'm expecting to hear i'm expecting something around the along the lines of we plan to have our our ducks in order and this time frame kind of thing i'm expecting something and next year i'm expecting to hear that uh what's the show that they said they're going to bring back when squadron's in last year oh uh oh gosh Briefing room. The last one they briefing room. I imagine I I I assume currently that the briefing room comes back next year. Yeah, sometime. I think year. so too. Uh, do you so think next be, year or th sometime this year? I think the briefing room will come back next year, and I don't even, I don't think at the beginning of the year. I think sometime during next year the briefing room, because I think that they're not going to try and push the release date too soon. So I think that they'll start the the kind of wind up next year. Mm -hmm. They'll finish it sometime during next year, and they have a a large buffer to do their final checks before they hit the go live button. Yep. So maybe like twenty five Invictus launch, possibly. Could be. All right. So that is back to you for graphics and VFX programming and Planet Tech. For both uh, Squadron and Star Citizen. Alrighty. Uh, pull that back up. Let's see. So we will start on the PU side. Uh, there we go. So graphics and VFX programming and Planet Tech. It's interesting that they lump all these together. Uh, the VFX programming team focused on finishing the damage map work for hole scraping. This mostly involved bug, bug fixing and performance improvements alongside reworking the debug options for damage maps and documenting the various amendments made for the hole scraping project. Improvements were also made to visuals, networking, and serialization and uh, damage maps in various edge cases found during PTU testing. When they say serializ serialization, they mean uh, everything uh, has serialized variables in order to um, record the state that it's in. And, um, Are you sure it's so not about breakfast? Th yeah, that too. Um, oh, I'm going to be okay. enjoying some serialization in the morning. Um, I'm going to get serialized Uh Oh man, that'd but be that... a great line of like food stuff. It's just like hacker like focused. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like Walmart, not in game. Like <laughs> IRL, like serialization, serial mm -hmm. kind of thing. Like that'd be great. Um, serialization is part of why PES is so important. It's such groundbreaking tech because anything that can have its state changed will have the have that state recorded. Um, uh, as part of the serialization, the serialized variables. Um, so uh, that's what they were talking about. You know, the the changes to um, how that uh, the state is recorded. So if you um, start salvaging something, it will record your progress on salvaging that thing. And when you come back to it, it will still be the same. You know, it won't be like you know reset over or you know it'll be all finished or something. 
um, and damage maps in various edge cases found during PTU testing. Lucky charms, but only one, zeros and ones. <laughs> <laughs> the planet tech team focused on polishing river tech and improving uh, resource streaming performance with a new and more aggressive threading model that guarantees a stall free experience. We'll see about that. Um, but uh, you know, that's really good that they're uh, working on that. And I hope that as they further improve that, you know, it will make it so that things, things uh, that way, things stream in and out uh, appropriately. You know, we yeah. don't have a sort I of also like imagine... popping in. I imagine the reason that all three of these teams are lumped in is because they basically all only own a sentence because they have bigger mm -hmm. uh, features they work on. Yeah. Um, additionally, maintenance was done to stabilize the Rastar tool. Uh, yeah, better get that thing stabilized. They need to use that thing so we can get more locations. Uh, more recently, work began on the asteroid SDF sign distance fields um, to introduce support for new primitives. I don't know what that means. Uh, shapes, new, new symbol shapes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So oh, and in order to make sphere. asteroids look different, have a greater variety yeah. of asteroids. That makes sense. Uh, the yeah, team so also like progressed with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the team also progressed with hardware assisted terrain instancing to improve the CPU submission time for, uh, footprint. A new local space for terrain vertices representation was introduced, which will improve improve floating point precisions and accelerate other internal operations. Here is all of this going way over my head. Like that. Yeah, th oh, this is why I take the small one and Nazareth has the engine. Because, yeah. Uh, finally, the team began looking at off-screen techniques um, uh, to achieve a localized water simulation model for water object interactions. Off-screen techniques to achieve a localized water simulation for water object interactions. Huh. Um, I guess they're talking about how things in the water interact with the water in order to make it look more realistic. You know, like plants, rocks, people walking through it, um, you know, what have you. Um, or the interesting a thing, system that's not technically tied to the water that simulates the reaction but mm -hmm. not a water simulation in the water. Uh huh. Okay. Um, they also didn't make any mention of Gen 12 for the first time in like forever as part of this section, <laughs> which is a good thing because Gen 12 oh, yeah. has been far left along that it's really just the engine people, you know, fine tuning it and optimizing it, not uh, these people working on it. And uh, back to you for Squadron 42 level design, it looks like. Don't you have the second bit of the... Uh, oh, yeah, the Squadron 42 program? part. Yep. Shh, yeah. you're quiet. Uh, gra Squadron 42 graphics and VFX programming. The VFX programming team began implementing new quantum travel and boost effects. Nice. Uh, these effects are now in a basic functional state and are triggering at generally the correct time. Generally. <laughs> Hopefully they can uh, narrow that down a little bit. Work will continue to expose timing controls and implement the functionality for adapting the effects to any size ship. Um, so they're making it so uh, that way this is systemic and they don't have to go through and redo this for each individual ship. It will be a systemic system based off of the size of the ship, uh, not so much you know the actual individual ship. Oh, juniors rolling around. There you go. Go back to sleep. Okay. Cool. Uh, work on the fire hazard system is ramping up again. Nice. Boot. Uh, as part of resource management and life support, all that. Um, starting with implementing requests for controlling fire and its propagation for design purposes. On the visual side, the team are currently planning out the work required for reaching the visual goals set by VFX art. Um, and Northern Trooper race, uh, ray tracing with the hot tub in the Connie Emerald. Ah, yep. That, see, it, it's finally going to be in. That this is what we've been waiting for. This this is the tech that will enable the hot tub. Hop, uh, it, mm -hmm. It's we're we're christening it here on the podcast. It is hot tub tech. Oh boy. Oh yeah. boy. Level design squadron forty two for Nazareth, and then back to me All for right. lighting. Nice simple one. The social team progressed well with the final in the final months of 2022. 
including continued scene work on their assigned chapters. New onboarding documentation was also created to better support new starters. Back to you for lighting. Alrighty, and lighting is over on the PU side. PU. Yep. Uh, lighting. Throughout November and December, um, I love this shot right here on screen. I I just cannot wait to see more oh, yeah. asteroid type facilities, you know, um, things on the surface, things under the surface, you know. Um, it, and that's yellow, isn't it? E- yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. You sure? I always I, I I I spend so much time following the game and so little time actually getting to play that I, mm-hmm. I generally forget. Yeah, hot tub tech. Yeah, everybody clip so, it. Anyway, clip it and I, share. I assume. <laughs> yeah, I assume this is work that will be done or it's being done to expand um, Grimhex because Grimhex is kind of a big landing zone because it's kind of like the pirate holdout and also like the nine tails base the nine tails don't come from art corp or they don't um they don't have a base around microtech they live in crusader area they're not coming from pyro they live at grimhex that's their territory Mm -hmm. it has their name literally all over and also it's kind of like the pirate holdout for players so it does kind of need to be a slightly bigger than it is currently, in my opinion. And right, well, it so needs to. The... I think that it that'll like Grim Hex is going to be bespoke, but I do think that we are going to see mm-hmm. some abandoned asteroid facilities. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So that's like a a, a a landing zone. We don't have a until well, I guess Rune Station will technically be a pirate landing zone. Yeah, Rune Station will be a landing zone. Grim Hex is kind of like a landing zone. I think the asteroid facilities are going to be like underground facilities, but in space. Mm. And some will be occupied I mean, and functioning and doing things, and others will be derelict, you know, based yeah. off of, you know, what the lore says. You know, this area is no longer profitable for mining for this corporation that built these things, and so they have abandoned them. Um, yeah. Watch lore equals gameplay, because that's the stuff that I talk yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's kind of what I mean, like, Grim Hex should be a landing zone. It, currently, the size of it feels much more like a uh, a station. Yeah, yeah. It does need to be expanded. The interior needs to be expanded upon. I I really would like it if it was not only the single asteroid that it's in, but like it had things connecting to other asteroids, you know, little expansion areas um, to, to make it bigger, kind of like how you have that for the, you know, a, a transit system. Um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if you watch the new Halo series, how they have that transit system going through yep. and in between the asteroids, um, I want that for Grim Hex to expand it to these other neighboring rocks that you know would be sort of tied to it. You know, make this not just an attachment point, but an attachment point with a flexible transit system in it. That would be super cool. Uh, yep. yeah. So um, the lighting team completed day and night lighting passes for the time trial racetracks. They also continued to improve all lighting aspects of the colonial outposts. Lighting is downstream, folks. Colonial outposts are well underway. They are very far along. They are making a crap ton of them for Pyro, and they're also working on them for um, Stanton. So, and once the lighting is done for the outpost, uh, if you uh, for the outpost, that means it is done for that segment of an outpost and they don't have to redo that lighting in order for them to make more variations of outposts. They, they're they doing the lighting for the individual modules that are built um, and the combinations so that way they look right. This also involves a lot of interior and exterior work to ensure they fit the environment and create the intended cold or cozy feeling within the buildings. After small changes were made to the jump down dynamic event, a lighting pass was done on a few areas to bring them back up to the current standard and ensure that the new additions additions fit the existing theme. Ex- I can't speak. Existing theme. I'm going to use the head again. Been drinking beer. All right. Let's moving on to in-game branding Montreal. One of my favorite teams, actually, because I like to see the the companies in the game exist in the game. Uh, so that's so it says the in-game branding team finished the last 
the year by completing several mandates. This included rebranding Security Post Korea, as we now have in 318, into Crusader Security Outpost, and redesigning Area 18's navigational signatures in support of the new player experience. So this will be uh, the first 30 minutes of gameplay so that a new player can figure out what to do. Also, um, many uh, tutorials are being released on YouTube and such. Uh, specifically, I'm taking this moment to plug my own channel because I will be working on making sure that I, I'm working and getting tutorials done. So by the time Invictus rolls around in the free flight, that I have enough to basically tutorialize a new player and get them at least uh, playing some form of the game. Uh, let's see. It says along tutorialization is kind of like serialization. Tutorialize is yeah. a, another brand of serial. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Has marshmallows. It says alongside the environment. Yeah. It says alongside the environment, narrative, and the marketing teams, in-game branding developed and implemented the visual identity for the last year's Drake-themed IE, uh, where we got the Cutter and the Corsair, as long uh, as well as the Vulture, kind of almost. The Vulture was supposed to be there, they just kind of that nah, didn't. Um, as well as working directly on in game location and events, the team continued to develop a catalog with guidelines for each in game brand. The goal of this upcoming internal tool is to make it easier for everyone from production to marketing to access information about Star Citizen's in fiction companies and improve consistency across the project. So that's the website, uh, ship sales in-game events literally everything if there's a like jump points little ads that show up in jump points literally everything this document is so that everyone is on the same literal same page with the branding for these companies uh they ended the year working on the visual identity for the invictus launch week and continued with uh continued the rework of lorville cool uh so that's Can't the wait invictus to see lorville 2.0 thursday we see it thursday yeah yeah, the, the update to that, and then what was the th the other thing they're covering in ISC on Thursday? It's uh, oh, new derelicts for three nineteen. Yeah, derelicts that are coming in three nineteen. So they're starting about talking about three nineteen this Thursday, which wonder, tells me that the shooting for Q one. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, three nineteen is going to be like three seventeen last year, where three nineteen is going to land in like April because three seventeen took a while to get out. Um, and mm -hmm. was you know, eventually came in April of last year. I think 319 is also going to have the same issue. Uh, people seem to think that, oh, well, 319 can't be that far along because I haven't finished 318. That's not how it works. It's not they've the same been, team. Yeah, they have different people working on different things, and the people working on 319 have been working on 319 for a while. And Yeah, you know, staggered anyway, development's it, a thing. Yeah, that, <laughs> this is how staggered development is meant to work. Um, the, the, the issue is uh, having QA assets. Um, but because 318 is now in wave one PTU, there are less QA assets devoted to 318 now than there were before. That's part of the reason of getting it out to wave one and getting it and out to Evo. Yeah. And they're looking for their opportunity to go wider PTU for 318. So, yeah. Yes. But, um, be, you know, I do think that that will impact, you know, 319's release, but I don't think it's going to impact it as much as people think. And I think we're still going to see 319, you know, April time frame with a 319.1 in May uh, for Invictus Launch Week. Remember, you know, I, Invictus Launch Week is in May. And then a 319.2, you know, sometime during the summer in order to hold us over until 4.0. Uh, 4 uh, a lot of people seem there's, to think there's, that there's a, I forget where they talked about it, but there should be a 9, uh, 320. I don't think that we're going to see a 320 at all. I, oh. I don't think we're going to see a 320 just because I think 319 is going to have the quantum stuff and the bounty hunter stuff that they are looking to introduce. Um, maybe there'll be a three 320 if the quantum stuff doesn't make it into um, or if they have to stagger the quantum stuff like they get uh, economy stuff in 319 and 320 you know, would be the AI stuff and um, AI services for uh, bounty hunting. Um, we'll just have to see, but I don't think yeah, for me, 320 would be everything that is done at that point, but that doesn't need survey. Just I, like I, they did. I think we need for three, for there to be a 320, there has to be significant things that couldn't be part of a dot X patch a significant improvements in, in tech or, um, new additions to gameplay. 
Um, otherwise, that's adding if you if you add another an, a whole another dev branch, you know, like adding three twenty that that would impact production of four point oh and testing of four point oh. Um, so that's why you know I think four point oh is going to be. Um, we talked about this. Um, we're mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna go on a little bit of a tangent because I think this is important. I'm gonna pull this up and I'm gonna find it. All right, is uh, Theories of War enough? Like, if Theories of War gets to a, or if the game gets enough to support Theories of War by a 320, would that be enough? Mm, maybe. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. So, letter from the chairman, May 18th, 2022. Let's scroll down. Oh, I was watching that. It's <laughs> in, where is it? Here we go. Oh, this was the first so, one. This is the first one. The, the the language is very important, and everybody read the second one in the same frame of mind after having read the first one and things from the first one not going according to plan. So, 2022 testing and release cadence. Because of this, we are going to be approaching 318 differently than our other previous releases. We are anticipating that 318 will require a much longer time at Evo PTU, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see. So much, here we go. Much longer time. BT. This is the paragraph. The goal will then be to get two to three months of testing on 318 in PTU for an alpha 318 release to live in late Q3 release to live in late Q3. That's important because in the most recent letter from the chairman, the language has, um, changed substantially. It's where's the paragraph? Mm-mm-mm. So, the language has changed substantially, and I, I actually feel guilty about this because I kind of trapped Paul in a in a statement when I was talking about it, and it was a sort of a test <laughs> to see how critically he read these you know, this most recent one in comparison to this one. Because when this one came out, I read this. And then I went back and read this and then I read, read this again because I was stuck in the airport for like four hours and I had the time, but <laughs> I asked Paul, I was like, you know, Paul, do you, you know, you don't think that they can release 4.0 in Q4? He's like, no, I don't. I think, you know, they, they haven't learned their lesson that they're not changing their expectations, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you don't think that they have altered their expectations. You don't think that they have, um, changed the, the, the way that they're approaching this. He's like, nope, they basically said the same thing that they did last year. And I was like, okay, all right, fair enough. Well, the goal will be then to get two to three months of testing on 318 and P2U for an alpha 318 release to live in late Q3. This is from the first letter from the chairman. Second letter from the chairman. We are aiming to put static server meshing and pyro into the hands of players in the fourth quarter of 2023. There is no mention of live. There is no mention of PTU. There is no mention of Eva Cotti, Nothing. They just said hands of players. So if at any point during Q4 of 2023, uh, 4.0 is at any in any way, shape, or form in the hands of players, whether it's Eva Cotti, whether it's live, you know, uh, you know, uh, out on the live servers or anywhere in between, they will have met this goal. That is much more open-ended than this statement. They very clearly learned their lessons and have changed their language and have changed their expectations between this and this. It's all in the language. But unfortunately, because we read th- we have read this and have been reiterating this and have seen how this has gone, we read this with bias. And everybody's like, live fourth quarter 2023, not going to happen. Well, they didn't say live t- fourth quarter 2023. They just said player's hands. These are what Paul calls weasel words, and Paul didn't catch on to it. Maybe he did, but I feel like I kind of caught him when I, I was asking him about it. So we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll have to re- uh, wait and see. Because I think that their goal is to show off 4.0 and Pyro at, at, at um, CitizenCon. And if it's not already in Evo, released to Evo by that point, um, 
you know, and it's probably going to be in Evo and then Wave 1, all that, you know, for all of Q4. I fully expect it to release in Q1 of 2023. But I do think that it is very reasonable for them to meet this goal with at some point in fourth quarter 2023, them having it in the player's hands at some point. You know, we just don't know, you know at what level. So this is where reading critically and shirking, you know, getting rid of your bias and rereading things is very important. When Nazareth and I are doing these monthly report readings, um, I have read these monthly reports three times each to make sure that I am able to reread these things and, you know, catch things that I missed, you know, and a lot of times I will share things with other people just to make sure that I'm not reading it incorrectly. You know, Nazareth and I talk back and forth for days prior to this as we're reading these things and reading them over again. That's what critical interpretation of data is all about. So that's my soapbox. Sorry. Tangent. Where were we? Locations. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I got onto that tangent just by seeing this picture of Pyro yep. and the stations in Pyro. Cause I'm like, Oh God, that looks so cool. It, it kind of yep. makes me think of like, um, you know, in sci-fi where they have those, you know, mega structures with, um, uh, like skyscrapers being built up into space or being built down into space from the, the mega structure. You know, it's mm. not, not technically that, but you know, it's not that big, but it just, I love the, the look of these things hanging down. Yeah. Um, yep. The one of your, actually, your one of your favorite teams is the location EU and mm-hmm. uh, sandbox. Yep. Yeah. Cause they're the ones that are making things real interesting, real fast. Uh, throughout <laughs> with all the tools that Naz and I just go nuts for. Um, uh, throughout November and December, EU Locations 1 continued working on the rundown Pyro Space Station. Interesting that they say Pyro Space Station, not space stations. If it, you know, Which I think that's just an internal uh, project naming problem. Yeah. The reason that they're not calling it Ruin Station and they're calling it Pyro Station or pyro stations because mm-hmm. lagrange points aren't populated or not all of them are not populated with stations it's not yeah. going to be everywhere it's going to be a station like in stanton yeah there's like pyro or ruin station is the hub of the system yep it's, it will be it very dangerous the landing zone. to not play. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it will be very dangerous to be away from ruin station for too long because there are not like a whole bunch of lagrange point stations to go and refuel in yeah, they are there, but they are small. System. They had limited facilities. The Pyro Space Stations is a deliverable on the progress tracker, and that is not referring to Ruin Station. Um, but they have gone. They, they have said Pyro Space Station. They have said Pyro Space Stations. They have said Ruin Station um, all throughout monthly reports previously. So they go back and forth a little bit, and it's kind of wishy-washy. And I can't mm-hmm. wait. One of the things I'm looking forward to the most is having my curiosity satiated to know what Lagrange points have stations. Because there are six planets in Pyro compared to the four in Stanton. Each planet technically has five Lagrange points. That's how the astrophysics works. Um, so they, you know... They, they could have up to 30 Lagrange point stations, but we know that there aren't going to be, th- you know, 30 stations at all these Lagrange points. There only will be a handful of them uh, in order to give Pyro the vibe that they're going for, especially considering that Pyro never had anywhere remotely close to the infrastructure that Stanton had. It would never make sense for them to build, uh, you know, too many space stations at these Lagrange points just because it wouldn't be necessary, even in Pyro's heyday. Um, yep. Yeah, so with more designers now on the team, they made great progress on the layout of each room and are currently exploring interesting gameplay options across the location. So really, I think, you know, this is, like Naz said, uh, when they say Pyro Space Station, run down Pyro Space Station, they're talking about Ruin. They have, you know, essentially, you know, finished the small rundown stations uh, of Pyro, and they're working on Ruin Station. Because and ruin uh, is wild... not something that's going to be like one and done, just like Lorville, yeah. just like um, what's it called, Crusader, Microtech, mm-hmm. Arncorp. It's a landing zone, which means there's so much space that will not be populated during this first run that they will have enough stuff to go back and add more stuff into. Yep. So when they say like making more or layout of each rooms, well, some may read that as oh, the layout's not even done. 
the main layout has been done, but for expanded gameplay rooms, that's what they're working on. Like there's yep. the corridors and the the shady back ends, the shady back ends of the shady station. Yeah, there's gonna be so many places you can go to get shanked, uh, or, or, or <laughs> you know, walk around a corner and buy illicit drugs. It's gonna be great. Yes, they um, should rename the uh, the station Shankaras. Yeah, um, <laughs> because yeah, and this is important because the ruined station, the actual ruined station deliverable, was removed from the progress tracker. You know, way back. And it never came back. For some on. reason. Um, or I think it did finally pop back on. But they, they removed it because they were using the other stations uh, to sort of build up the asset library for Ruin Station. Um, nope, no Ruin. Before moving on to Ruin Station itself. Um, EU Locations 2 worked alongside the US-based PU team to add new cargo elevators into existing hangars, which will be used during the updated cargo gameplay. There we go. There it is. You know, we have, um, they're, they're, they are working on the freight elevators. Hooray, finally. Uh, Pre-production of the local law office locations began, which will be essential for several upcoming gameplay loops. I'm bound to hand over you um, They also worked on IAE and the new player experience, the latter of which involved improving existing landing zones for new visitors. I'm so glad that they are working on that finally. Not that your tutorial videos aren't great and you're doing a great job, Nazareth, but <laughs> they do really need to work on the new player experience an awful lot. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, EU Sandbox 2 wrapped up the year with further exploration and experimentation for underground facilities. Yes. Can't wait to see more of these. I can't wait to see them in game. They're going to be awesome. So I did a bit of exploratory math on this one. A couple, I think this was the la one of the last streams on the you did channel. You did Oh, no. Oh, I did so much math. Um, <laughs> so much math. Um According to the numbers that they showed off in one of the ISCs, they are only about halfway through tier zero with a year of work. So assuming that all the math and all of the progress tracker and the stuff that he had on his screen during the ISC actually still is applicable and they didn't change anything, make anything longer or cut tier zero down any, uh, we're not looking at a underground facility release this year. I could see it. Yeah, I, I could see them getting a lot of work done. And I think they're going to do the underground facilities like they have. If you think about it with the reclaimer being the first derelict and then mm -hmm. they're doing more and more and more derelicts. I think we're going to see the first one and it'll be, you know, it'll be one one underground facility, maybe like one type with a little bit mm -hmm. of variation uh, and a couple of them, you know, sprinkled throughout, just like with the, you know, like, you know, uh, with the, the derelicts. And then they will build on that because they are they're, they're building them with tools, but they still yeah. have to build the um, add the things into the asset libraries. They have to get the workflow done. But once the workflow is done, once we get to a tier zero, tier one, then that production level goes from this to this. You know, it becomes exponentially greater as they can, okay, we've gotten the process down um, and now we can build them at scale much more quickly with the newbies that we're hiring straight out of university. And here's the tool, here's how you use it, this is what we need you to build, you know, and then somebody comes back and checks your work. Yeah, I can totally see like a tier point. Uh, point 0.9 version of a uh, mm -hmm. new UGF in 4.0. Yeah, uh, yeah, like exactly. That, uh, this is the, a... the proof of concept that we that mm -hmm. we finished, just like the river. I could see the like a, the proof of concept, a couple of them getting added to Stanton as part of 4.0, and then they're already showing us the work in progress for the derelict ones at that point um, versus the concept mm -hmm. art that we saw. Yeah. Yeah, whatever and, tier one has in it. Mm -hmm. That uh, over to you for narrative. Uh, let's do narrative PU to start. Narrative PU. All right. Okay. Towards the end of the year, the narrative team assessed 
assisted with the new security outpost or security post career and pleasure rehabilitation mission contents. This is specifically help with the mission, so the text needed for those or the design of those. Then coordinated with design on the new time travel racing missions, along with mission text, narrative introduced Wildstar uh, racing into Star System lore to create an organization responsible for arranging the races. And this is, so Wildstar is a uh, lower tier than the Murray Cup. It's kind of that uh, backyard racing kind of vibe. Um, it's the entry level uh, organization you would get in contact with um, and you, your career would go through Wildstar organization into later on being able to compete in the Murray Cup. So that's how that's kind of woven into both the gameplay and the lore. Uh, let's see. A quote from their team. The backstory. Oh, I just it, that says here. I thought I read it somewhere else. Anyway, the backstory is that they began as a group of enthusiasts who would share vids of themselves racing on their favorite local tracks. Since then, they have grown into a sanctioned racing organization, especially rally tracks, and are widely recognized as an affordable proving ground for amateur racers to work towards competing in high level profile, higher profile leagues, such as Cup. Um, and also, they're the one that goes through that uh, lily pad planet that I always forget names for. Oh, I forget which race actually goes through there. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yep. The, yeah. Um... Mm hmm. Crap. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. You think on that. Yeah. Oh, keep going. They're, they're, uh, they're like giant. Uh, uh, yeah. One of them started reef, uh, but it's sinking a, a reef. during the race. Yeah. Cause they, they, they had built too much onto it and now. Yeah. Uh, there, too many, restricted... no, uh, there were too many people that year. And so one mm -hmm. of them started sinking. Yeah. So some of the racers like, no, we're going to help. We're not finishing the race. We're going to help. Yeah, whatever the plan that was, whatever race that was. Uh, for future patches, narrative begin planning new missions, and new mining and salvage missions, which will help expand the career choices available throughout the contract manager. Yes. Uh, like that's not like don't don't like gloss over those. These are missions for mining and missions for salvage, not just go do mission or go do activity and pay with whatever you do. This is, hey, there's a bunch of ships over in X position. We need you to salvage their stuff and bring it back. Or we contract you to go get 20, you know, tons of Haddonite or whatever. Missions. So good. Um, work also continued on investigation missions. I can't remember. Uh, with several new mysteries for players to solve being developed. And these are not just like the mission, the investigation mission we have in the game where it's oh go click on as many bodies as possible or the Kovlex one it's seven tiers higher than that where we will actually have the chance to put on our Sherlock cap and actually dig into a, a mystery and I can't wait for that especially the horror ones like the the no one in space can hear you scream kind of one where you're uh, going through a derelict reclaimer and you're not quite sure if the crew's entirely dead. Uh, additionally, the team discussed sandbox mission content, where players will encounter missions in the universe without accepting a specific contract. So this is, ties heavily into quantum, and you're going along your space travels, and you run into somebody being attacked by pirates. That kind of thing. Not a mission you accepted, but a mission you might help with. Not, depending on how you your alignment. Uh... The team also planned a reorganization of how in-game text is sorted. This is a big deal. Uh, the internal tool developed to house all the game text strings is used by many different departments, and it has become clear that a new folder structure would help clarify, clarify yeah, where some strings should be placed. Now that planning is complete, the hope is to roll out the reorganization in the, in the upcoming year. Time was also spent updating some of the detailed planetary conditions, such as temperature and atmospheric content, for an upcoming star system. Uh, for an upcoming star system to more clearly align with what the entire gameplay and solar positioning, or and with solar positioning, interesting uh, uh, foreshadowing there. But before the, you uh, continue, because I, I I was going to continue. I was going. I was going back to the uh, re reorganization. I imagine. Sherry Heiberg had a 
big part in that because she's the archivist. This is literally her job is to mm -hmm. make stuff easily findable and categorizable and storable. So, yep. like I said, many different teams are using in-game text. They need to know where to find it. And for them to know where to find it, they need to know where to put it. So this will not necessarily have a lot of impact on the wide project, but as far as like building a mission and trying to find text from somewhere for something, it will be much more easily findable when they implement this new file structure. That way they yeah, don't have any about conflicts that. about what they, they put into that too. Yeah. You know, mission. If they set, go to look you know, for something and then unify. Oh, nothing's there. I'll just write my own. Oops. Yeah. Or, or, or they, you know, oh, okay. I'll just paraphrase this. No, don't do that. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. What were you about to say before I move on? So I screenshotted this and posted it to my YouTube and also Twitter, and I made a meme. So, uh, <laughs> um, you mean? Yeah. So last night I was streaming and I, I got part of the way caught up on Lore Equals Gameplay. Lore Equals Gameplay is this series where I stream and I go through the lore updates um, and I don't do all of them, but I do like the Galactopedia updates. I do new serialized fiction bits um, and I read them um, just to, you know, inform people about the lore, but also apply, you know, okay, you know, this, you know, you read through this and you're like, okay, this is referring to this gameplay. This is, you know, especially with the Galactopedia updates um, when they talk about planets and locations and star systems, they, update that and in no uncertain terms they tell you very clearly what the themes will be for what's going on you know at this planet this moon in this star system uh that sort of thing here they are basically telling you straight up what paul you know paul first paul came up with the lore equals gameplay um statement and i i i adopted it um, you know, he he's the, the the sort of Cad Bane guy. He was you know. bored into it. Bored yeah, by it. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know about the lore <laughs> until you were a man. I was born into it, molded by it. I didn't see the yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, that yeah. So time was also spent updating some of the detailed planetary conditions, such as temperature and atmospheric content, for upcoming star systems to more closely align with the intended gameplay and solar positioning. So I didn't read the um, S. I didn't read the yeah. S on star systems. I yeah, said star, star system. I was assuming I so this is this is a great chance to explain what Tree was saying. We came into that uh letter with bias. I came into that sentence with bias, already mm -hmm. assuming that it was talking about Nyx. That's not talking about Nyx. That's talking about Nyx, Nascom, Odin. Well, Odin's probably done at this point, but oh so mm -hmm. yeah, all of them. All the ones Everything. that they have in this in this work. Everything that is in the that pipeline is... going forward in the not terribly mm -hmm. distant future is what they're talking about. They're getting they're going to work on systems beyond that later on, but they're getting the near term stuff as they ramp up production ready to go. And this is important because a lot of people are like, and Paul was included in this until I showed him the evidence, and he's like, "Holy shit, you're right, dude." I was like, "I know, right? I'm not crazy." <laughs> yeah. Because I, I did a big Shocking. old segment on yeah I did a big old segment on this for Pathfinder so it was one of the first episodes that we did mm -hmm. um, because I noticed that there were I think uh, it was the first actually I think that was episode one you brought out the giant sheet yeah. of hey, they changed we don't know why hey Nazareth I know we just started doing this podcast but look how insane I am <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean that's why I messaged you in the first place because you were like yeah. yeah I think I can find that seven hours later yeah here's the entire document I just wrote up. You want attention to detail? You have no idea. <laughs> but um, that's the exact reason why. What I was doing is I was going through the um, the Arc Star map, and you you know a lot of us use the SC Tools wiki, and I noticed mm -hmm. that a lot of the star systems had different sizes listed between the wiki and what was on the star map, and I was like, wait a minute, why is that? And then I went back and I found that you can go on the log for the pages on the wiki and see you can see when updates were were made. And I saw that the, 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 you know, the, the star system data, you know, like the, the, just the, 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 the size, the, the AU for an individual star system was basically added when it was, uh, when the star map was made and hadn't been updated. I was like, well, wait a minute. That means the star map has been updated. And so I started doing some digging and there was a, a, a person on spectrum that made multiple posts in 2016, 2017, 2018 chronicling, 
um, the changes that were being made to the star map. And they had a incomplete script that's kind of like how a shiny tracker does with the roadmap and the progress tracker that was able to glean the updates to the star map when it was updated. Even though the narrative team does not post any of this, it all happens behind the scenes. No one is made aware of it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm one of two people that know that this is going on. And one of the thing, you know, things that were changing, they uh, changed you know, the size of planets, they changed the type of stars, they changed the distance from the, the star um, for different planets, um, they uh, changed uh, the location of jump points within the star systems, they changed the sizes of jump points, they added new jump points, they changed the sizes of star systems, all sorts of stuff was being changed you know, basically on a quarterly basis as Sherry Heiberg and the narrative team were going through to make the systems both more realistic but also align with gameplay. And I was like, holy Are shit. Are you telling me that when they built uh, Pyro that wasn't the first time they decided to change the star system into something that made more sense? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so this is them going through and updating the information on planets with uh, the uh, 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 planets in the upcoming star systems, the ones that they're going to be building next, they're updating the lore data regarding planetary conditions, such as temperature, such as that's not just temperature and atmospheric content mm -hmm. for upcoming star systems to more closely align with their intended gameplay and solar positioning. So they are doing some light retconning, um, but they're doing it in order to make it be more aligned with intended gameplay and solar positioning. So it'll be very interesting to see if we can catch some of these updates if they get added to the star map. Um, because when I go do lore equals gameplay, I read all the updates. And so they will tell you about the atmospheres, you know, and, you know, sort of generally, you know, it has this type of atmosphere. It's cold, it's hot, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it gets you an idea of what the surface conditions are going to be like um, it, along with the information that they gave you about what's going on on that planet. Are there settlements? You know, it, does mining occur there? Um, you know, is it a, you know, is it like, uh, is it a, a smuggler's den or a, um, you know, a, a slaver's, um, you know, a, a hideout or something like that. So it's, it's very interesting. And that's why I do the Lore equals gameplay update, uh, videos because the information in the Galactopedia is the most up to date and it doesn't, it, it generally follows very similarly to what you will find for planets and such on the star map, but not verbatim. And there is, has been a lot of changes. So for the star systems that are upcoming, I bet you we will see um, uh, that they are doing additional changes for, we'll, we'll see more stuff going into you know, the, the Galactopedia updates and I bet you that will uh, we'll have to come back and revisit this, you know, in the next couple of months with those updates to see um, what things are being changed and where. Yeah. So you know, um, stay tuned. And Aether Drift actually has a great idea for you, and this would actually work well as shorts. Is take a system and go through the change history. Mm hmm. Actually, a really cool idea for you. I wish we had more detailed information because the person who is making who is scraping it he stopped doing or he or she they stopped doing their updates in 2018 at the end of 2018 so we really only had updates chronicling um the first three years of the star map but mm -hmm. i know for a fact that changes have continued to occur since then because i have been able to go through the the more recent updates um that were there and look at a few things and find discrepancies of like, oh, okay, this was, this was what this was in 2018. It is not this any longer. Um, things like the size of Nyx. The size of Nyx has changed three times that I know of. Hmm. Yeah. It was initially 30, like 39 AU. It's currently 11. Yeah. So. That's a lot um, smaller. Yeah, it's a lot smaller. Um Things have changed dramatically and they have changed behind the scenes and people aren't taking note. But um, the reason I look at the Galactopedia updates is because it is the most current information. They're not just mm -hmm. copying the information from the old comlinks, you know, that are, you know, four, five, six, ten years old. 
They, yeah. they, they are they also, updating it. That's when, why it's called an update. Yeah, when each of those Galactopedia updates go out, there's a it's preceded by a ton of updates. Mm-hmm. And over the course of the day, also more updates roll out. Yeah. So it's it's kept up to date. So the November and December Galactopedia updates, I streamed those last night. Um, I have to add, uh, I'll be adding Armchair Admirals and Generals, um, the most recent episode to my YouTube starting tomorrow over the next, over this week. And then following that, I'll add Lore Equals Gameplay. And then this episode of the Pathfinders will get added to YouTube. So I have a backlog. I always have a backlog. <laughs> yep. Nice. And, uh, but yes, please uh, resume. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and Walker 300. There's only a hundred or so star systems. Shouldn't take you but a day or two to update all of them. Oh yeah. Piece of cake with all my free time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, the end of the year also brought a variety of, including a portfolio about the history of the IAE, a new clean shot with predictions about the expo, a lore makers community question, the hazy days short story, and in and a word from our sponsors post featuring some Luminaria adverts and a section of the Galactopedia posts for November and December. Finally, the narrative team also announced that 2023 will bring changes to the website's lore release schedule. That's release, that change was they are no longer making lore, <laughs> lore posts. Um, yeah. They will still be doing their uh, lore team things. So their lore makers, community guides, and the Galactopedia stuff that they're still going to be doing. But they will not be doing any short stories, any uh, any kind of uh, not. They're not doing portfolios, stories, or any of the like inverse show things. Mm-hmm. So all of that is put on an indefinite hold, and this version of indefinite is the actual form of indefinite. That yeah. means they don't know when they're picking it back up, but it's kind of just on hold. They don't know when they're picking it back up. Yeah, they're uh, going to they continue doing... to put out stuff from like the old jump points and everything. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, what they will oh. be doing though is taking all that power that they have and turning it towards the game and shooting it that way. So the yeah. game is going to have a much more rich uh, tactile lore being added to it. Wild they're doing that because the dialogue. development is ramping up and they need them to flesh out the things that are going to be in game not just writing stuff that's, you know, the the background information, you know, the, the mm-hmm. yeah, the, the, the details wild versus lines. the Wild Lions down. needs a lot of work. Uh-huh. Like, what is it? Dynamic conversation system. That needs so many lines of dialogue because mm-hmm. it's supposed to cover anything that could happen over the course of a year, which means all your events need dialogue. And it shouldn't be just one line like, oh, the Invictus week is on from every single NPC. So you're going to need like a dozen or so for Invictus, a dozen or so for AIE, um, and each of the holiday events, plus Nine Tails and all the dynamic events, plus how they're feeling on that day. What's the weather that day? You know, all of these things. Are you a good person? Are you a bad person? How is the NPC? The dynamic conversation system is one of the biggest narrative undertaking tasks I've ever seen in a game, period. So it's I cannot wait to see that in the Persistent Universe. All right, on to Squadron Forty Two's narrative. Oh, uh, November and December were busy months for the narrative team. Firstly, they worked. They had a week long performance capture shoot, which we've been talking about literally this entire thing, in the UK to close out capturing wild lines for one of the enemy factions, as well as a narrative cuts or content cut content scene for a set piece. They also picked up content to support the new dynamic conversation system. I think I just mentioned something about that. That will provide exciting (laughs) opportunities for NPCs to chat with others. This opens a lot of opportunities for contextual conversations that can help maintain the illusion of life and storytelling outside of dedicated scripted scenes. This is a system being designed with Squadron in mind that will be added to Star Citizen. They've already talked about it several times. And yes, this is also a tool, so definitely in our wheelhouse anyway. Uh, the team continued to hold reviews with various design teams to develop updated scripts and provide placeholder recordings to ensure that the lines are not 
only create in the right dynamic or dramatic beats, but also clearly indicate what the player is meant to do in order to progress. So yay, those annoying like, hey, I think that you should be over here. You should go investigate that door. The like the nudging uh, conversation that whatever voice in your head is going to be having. Uh, narrative also met with characters to ensure that all necessary costumes have been requested to support the various chapters that specific NPCs appear in. Uh, that one specifically is a closeout kind of uh, what's it called? Uh, sentence. All necessary costumes have been requested. I hope that's the last time we hear about costumes until um, Squadron Episode 2. And finally, we finish off with a quote from the narrative team. Based on the scope of the script, it shouldn't come as a surprise that there are a lot of characters that will uh, players will meet over the course of the game. This list is com uh, complicated by the fact that some of the characters will have a schedule that will drive them from work to rest, necessitating a variety of clothing to be available uh, to them, or be to be available. The narrative team. So not just a commander uniform for the commander but also an off-duty uniform or a um pretty uniform what are they called um not pretty uniform what are they called what are the ceremony ceremonial uniforms for some of them so lots of costumes but they are now all requested i, I like reading monthly reports for squadron this year is going to be just a trip yeah. All right, so that's back to you for Interactables. The nice new camping chair um, team. Camping chair team. <laughs> Literally, like the month they were mm -hmm. invented, the Interactables team, they, they came on I, uh, SCL to make a camp chair. I'm excited about it. Um, <laughs> the Interactables team continued their work on Pyro, creating more advanced and unique assets, including stalls that can be found in the rundown station. Prototyping continued on deployables. Ooh, deployables. Uh, these like assets, yeah, take a long time <laughs> to figure out and overcome unforeseen challenges that are presented by other teams to ensure they do not hinder gameplay. I'm I'm very interested to see more about deployables, like these. Um, so this one looks like it has a flame on it, but I when I saw these, I was like, oh look, it's a 30th century shop vac. You know, but you can see all the crap that you're sucking up. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to bring carry this over to my I ship. I think and those gonna, are actually you know, just suck liquid up the dirt and dust at the, the foot rest. Yeah. I would imagine these are liquid or gas carryable containers. Mm -hmm. Probably. So um, that you'd probably like pull them over like to gas up your, you know, uh, ship or whatnot. Well, they don't look like they have some any sort of mechanism, but you know, for, for fueling up. And maybe there's something that you insert because there's a connection right here. Maybe it's something mm -hmm. that you insert to a device or something Ooh, like that. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Either way, and whatever is in here... There's the hose off of it, so... Yeah. Uh, whatever goes in here causes cancer. I guarantee it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pure <laughs> lead-lined gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is all cancerous. Uh, don't lick the inside of that. Uh, in December, fixes were made for the current in-game coffee machines. Soon, players will be able to take select cups to these machines and have infinite cups of co infinite cups of coffee. Can we <laughs> can we just convert me into a character so I don't have to live in the real world and I can go in Star Citizen and have infinite coffee? That sounds amazing. Uh, uh, Neuralink. <laughs> yeah. Uh, progress was also made on a new template for an asset that will be integral to bounty hunting, which Take is running alongside, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and not the, the fluffy ones, uh, which is running alongside Aww. Environment Arts Bounty Hunting Office. Um, a new asset that will be integral to bounty hunting. I don't think it's the handcuffs. I, I think I think? I think it's the I think it's the pods. I think it's Stasis pods. I want pizza too. Um, but uh, just like how things occur in real life, I drink coffee first thing in the morning. I have pizza for uh, at the latest after I've had coffee, leftover pizza for breakfast, but you know, definitely for dinner. So sorry, coffee comes first. Without a character, you just die. play for an asset. This is true. This is interactable's not weapon feature. Mm -hmm. 
I I think it's I think this is going to be time. I think that's the the cryo pods or the stasis pods whatever they are um gel pods which is running alongside environment office uh environment arts bounty hunting office yeah so mm-hmm. we'll see soon tm Finally, the team started pre-production on lootable content, including improving the current loot pool. Um, looking forward to seeing what more loot stuff we can find. Uh, the question is, are they only talking about lootables for Pyro or just in general? I mean, and back say to you. anything specific. Yeah. And back to you for tech art animation uh, for Somehow. PU. You divide, you divide it up. How it did says I tech screw animation. this one up that bad? I don't know, Nazareth. How did you? I don't know. Uh, okay, so there's only like three left. So tech animation. It's mine. And then you get online services. And then I get live tools. And then you get web platform and then I get eh, uh, web platform and then I get the last one hey I get the last you know screw up all the spelling to all these things all right tech animation star citizen at the end of 20 no what what hold on is that my typo or is that their typo my typo somehow on my document that says 2023 on the thing in front of you it says 2022 i don't know if i if they updated the thing i don't know how that happened supposed to be 2022 okay weird i have no idea how that happened anyway magic the end of 2022 tech art completed a dirt slash wear pass for all cockpit glass to ensure the pilot's vision isn't obscured. Thank God. (laughs) Have you ever tried to, or in recent history, have you tried to use the uh, MSR turrets? Oh yeah, they're bad. Oh, they're so bad. (laughs) A similar pass for turret glass is planned for for a future update. Why would they need to do another pass? Either another similar pass. Well, they said cockpit glass and for pilots, and then they're going to do turret glass. Oh, okay. Why okay. they're I... two separate systems, I don't know. That seems like... Time. Only... Time. They probably had enough time to do cockpits before the break, and they'll get back to turrets after the break. Why is glass for one different than the other? Why not just make it a singular system? It seems like a lot of uh, extra work. Different materials, like the... Um... MSR uses a colored glass on the front end. And also different like different wear patterns. Each glass probably has or each kind of section of glass has its own wear patterns. It's not just a uh, vignette of wear. It wears you you have more um buffer of large wear on the edges but not in the middle. So but in a turret, you want much more visibleness, not just in their straight shot. Saying those reasons, there's those reasons. Uh, let's see. The graphics team delivered mesh targeting or tagging tech that will be used in Alpha 318 and beyond to fix various lighting issues on the ships, ramps, and doors. This enables the devs to tag a mesh that moves between zones to receive interior, exterior, or automatic transition lighting. Yay, no more flickering light on or flickering ramps. Uh, this will help with most related problems. Most, not all. Uh, they also worked alongside the ship artists and engineers to enable shader damage for hull scraping on all vehicles in the game. Nice job, guys. Uh, new ramp physics collision. New ramps physics. Yeah, new ramp physics collision type was added to the Drake Corsair. One. Uh, one allows the tip of the ramp to ignore terrain, while a uh, hidden wheel-only collision helps small vehicles and wheel ve- wheel trolleys traverse gaps. Awesome! Well done. Hopefully that rolls out to the rest of the uh, ramp ships soon. Uh, in the ship pipeline, the team closed out the Drake Vulture, 
while the Corsair and Cutter received update updated debris, SDF volumes, landing systems, viz areas slash portal optimizations, new segmented turret viz areas in turrets, and local grid lifts, local grid and lift lift and ramp tech. So all of them have the new ramp tech again. Uh, the new team also further development on the Miss Call C's interior walkway animation, which syncs with the exterior hull transformation. The final walkway will be a skinned asset with 10 sliding rings connected by stretchy tubing. Did I stretchy fix this to make tubing. it broken? No, okay. Stretchy tubing, yep. So, on to tech animation for Squadron. Uh, tech animation spent the end of the year focused on head asset uh, processing. Uh, we, this is a quote from tech animation team. We've been taking some long overdue actors and starting the initial processing procedure to create their likeness. This includes creating over 78 scans per head per head asset and processing them to the nat neural neutral yeah yeah neutral head asset. Some of these actors were scanned over seven years ago. And the main shoot for a squad or on the main shoot for Squadron 42. So they look quite different these days. I think that's that's gonna be fun for the team, like to look at like a seven year old picture and knowing like seeing them in movies today. <laughs> it's gonna be hilarious. Uh, let's see. And the team takes these complex scans and breaks them down into individual muscle, movements and then applies them applies and applies them to the facial rig asset, ultimately including them in the to give more variety to heads and faces seen in game. It's cool. Not only do they are they scanning in heads for the characters themselves, but also parts of the heads are also going into NPCs. And then it is wait. There's a section here that's not in either thing, but it's blue. I think that's also mine. Nope, that's a duplicate somehow. Alright. On to you for online services Montreal. Okie dokie. Online services. The online services team spent the majority of November and December on Alpha 318 stabilization. You have more work to do, uh, performance improvements, and bug fixing. Time was also spent with the DevOps publishing team, producing uh, production tuning the new services and new graph database used by persistent entity streaming. A significant effort was also spent tracking down edge cases in the new character repair that will replace the current character reset with an emphasis on finding possible exploits and potential failure, failure points in the system. Back to you for Live Tools Montreal. All right. The Live Tools team focused on developing features related to persistent entity streaming, persistent entity streaming including the new login flow module in into the network operations center. Now users can manage entitlements directly through hex which is a major step forward. Another tool related to persistent entity streaming is the entity, entity graph tool, which was further developed and implemented. This module offers the ability to search and visualize the various entities attached to a player or an account on the associated and the associated details. I imagine this is what we saw at Sizzicon when they were trying to tell us how the entity graph works and all mm -hmm. the little lines, uh, edges and uh, nodes. Cat, stop touching the keyboard. Um, all right. And then lastly, we have these new modules provide more versatility, versatility, versatility to Hex and contribute to making it a powerful tool for investigation and issue resolving. And that's for the devs themselves, not for us. No, no investigation into Hex for us. So that is back to you with Turbulent Web Platform. The end of 2022 saw Turbulent adding the Alexandria tool library with a new module called Grid. The Grid tool gives content creators another way to present information and was first used in the Luminalia calendar. The team also progressed well with the SSV project, which provides the ability to adjust the color palette of any themes. This tremendously complex project saw the dev and design teams come together in the most creative ways, Turbulent web platform team. They also continued to add the uh, to the manufacturing library, this time adding Origin Jumpworks. Uh, Turbulence experience team focused on reworking the initial uh, new user flow from selecting a starter package to downloading and entering the game. December saw them start development after many months of design iteration and technical decision making. 
Awesome. So not only are they working on the new player experience in game, but they're also working on the new player experience to the website, which desperately needed uh, a lot of work. If you are not a veteran and familiar with the website, it can be painstaking to use uh, and causes a lot of frustration. Uh, let's see. So they are, they are, um, they're, they are focused on the new user flow. Um, so they've started development on that. Um, uh, after, you know, they, they basically white boxed it and done all the design decision stuff. And now they're actually putting that into development. The community team continued to polish the community hub with a majority of the new feature set to be released in early 2023. Excellent. Please let me see it, including better connection to large events and player generated content. I want to see this. Let's, uh, let's make it happen. I want to see this thing have actually, you know, a, a lot more functionality than it already does. Finally, for Turbulent, the architecture team put numerous hours into the PHP 8 upgrade. After six months in the making, it hit the production environment and was warmly welcomed by the wider development team. Back to you for the last segment, VFX, starting with the PU. All right. Star Citizen, throughout, Star Citizen VFX. Throughout November and December, the VFX team worked through tasks for Alpha 318. This included putting the fishing time on putting the finishing touches to new vehicles and lots of task tool and snag list fixes and tweaks. They also continue to support salvage effects, making adjustments after seeing some inconsistencies in backer footage from PT or PTU Wave 1. More help from backers. Amazing. Uh, VFX also began to plan for the overwhelming but necessary restructuring of their generic effect libraries. The libraries contain the most commonly used effects, including smoke, steam, and sparks, and have become too bloated over the years. In the months ahead, the team will be reducing the number of individual effects living in the libraries while making visual improvements as they go along. I like how they call it overwhelming, but necessary. Yeah, it's it's a big task, but it should um, not only make things like, you know, these individual effects look a lot better, but you know, mm-hmm. having the the engine's ability to find them when they need them will be much more efficient. And so, instead of having things that don't end up just not working and not showing up, you know, because it takes too long or there's some sort of error in sourcing whatever that effect yeah. is, you know, it, it should be able to do it much more reliably. Yeah, and I imagine there there are ways to use the same effect so that you don't have to have a smoke medium, smoke small, smoke large, smoke bloated, smoke you know X yeah. Y Z. So cutting down where they have just unnecessary ones and i imagine there will be something missing when they go through this sometime and they'll be like ah yes this effect was supposed to be added because we removed that effect i just imagine that will be some something they they go through so as our last last segment uh vfx squadron 42 throughout november and december the vfx team progressed with the particle library overhaul this included creating a custom level showing all available effects which is useful for other VFX artists to quickly view the effects libraries. Uh, the artist also continued to support the art and design teams on key locations and cinematic scenes. Elsewhere, working alongside the VFX programmers, the new quantum travel effects, which were mentioned earlier, were made functional. Previously, they were in-game prototypes. Having seen these effects working properly, or properly working, there is still some tweaking to be done to better match the prototype. And that is the Star Citizen and Squadron for two month reports for word November for and December. Yeah. And now and we, we got still got it done now. in just over three hours. You know, with the intro stuff, we're probably, you know, just a hair over three hours. That's pretty good considering how thick the these combined reports are, especially when it's and how much we went on. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's six weeks of work instead of four. Or so um yeah, well, not not bad, sir. Not bad. Well, everyone, if you're still hanging out with us, would uh, uh, say we really appreciate you hanging out with us. Um, I need to get us out of here pretty quickly because I need to hit the hay. I've got a long day of travel ahead of me. Um, but um, I'll let Nazareth take it out take it out here in a second. But first, we need to pick somebody to raid because I'm always bad about remembering to raid someone, and I feel bad for not sharing the love. So if you have any suggestions, please let us have them in chat. Um, but uh, I would like to uh, raid uh, someone. And if no one gives me a suggestion, we're going to go raid Marcus the Way. He's the only person that I follow um, that is currently uh, uh, 
uh, streaming right now. Uh, one thing before you go, uh, Ether Drift, what do you what do you got? Don't keep me waiting, man. <laughs> well, he's got to wait for like the delay to come back to read his things to then post. So, mm-hmm. got at least ten seconds of time. Yep we we need we need suggestions for the raid. Um, if I don't get a, 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 a suggestion other than Marcus the way, um, in ten seconds. We're going to raid Marcus the way with uh, you know everyone else who is here. Ten. Uh, I have to say that you guys have to snip these reports into bite-sized chunks. I would love to have the time to do that. But unfortunately, I have a full-time job, and I'm in the Army National Guard, and I'm married with a one-year-old. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to go with Marcus the way. We'll raid Marcus the way. Check him out. Uh, uh, say hi. Tell him we, we sent you. Um, and let's get that started. Nazareth, why don't you take us out as you always do? All right. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. It has been a wonderful stream. There was a lot of content through. Um, thank you for everyone who showed up in chat, and thank you for everyone who watched in the VOD. And definitely, if you guys have comments and suggestions and ideas and opinions about what you've heard now today, uh, put down in the comments. Like the video if you liked it, as always. Um, and i got to say, thank you all for coming. And have a good one. And well, I forgot what I always say. Oh, yeah. Be kind. Have a good night, everybody.